Stone Ocean is a six-part in the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manga series. Written and illustrated by Hirohiko Araki, it was published in the Weekly Shonen Jump from 1999 to April 21st of 2003. Interesting bit of information, in its original publication, it was titled, JoJo Part 6, Jolene Kujo, Stone Ocean. And as many of you know, David Production adapted the first 12 episodes, which was initially released on Netflix on December 1st, 2021. Unfortunately, there's been no news regarding the next installment of episodes. Hence, the reason I decided to produce a video going over the major plot points of the manga. For those of you who can't wait to see what happens next to Jolene, Hermes, and Emporio. Now, if you've already finished the first 12 episodes and you want to pick up from there, I'll leave a timestamp in the video. But for everyone else, let's start from the beginning and experience an exhilarating journey into Green Dolphin Street Prison to see what happens to our main protagonist, Jolene Cujo. It's 5.35 p.m. A young woman with a butterfly tattoo is seen in a rainstorm next to a red car. She stares at the corpse of a mangled man. Inside a holding area, a female prisoner with braids is annoyed by the noise of another prisoner. Jolene continues to bang her head, revealing that she's upset because she was caught masturbating by one of the guards. Jolene and the braided hair prisoner want to make a bet with a blonde haired prisoner to see who can hold out the longest in terms of masturbation. Jolene claims she can determine her crime by examining the joint on her left ring finger. The braided hair prisoner wonders how Jolene got here and she claims that she was framed. Jolene's lawyer informs her that she's being sent to the Green Dolphin Street Prison's administrative center to receive her punishment. The lawyer brought her clothing as well as a shiny amulet from her father. She wonders what father as she cuts her own finger on the amulet. Jolene says her father was never there for her, even when she was critically ill as a child. Inside the amulet, we see a picture of Jotaro, Jolene's father. She tosses the amulet into a nearby drain pipe. Take care of yourself, Jolene Cujo. It is now November 6, 2011, as Jolene arrives at the Green Dolphin Street Prison in Florida, also known as the Aquarium. The braided hair prisoner reveals her name to be Hermes Costello, and this is her second time here. Hermes tells Jolene they'll need at least $100 to $200, otherwise they'll have to take care of them themselves. Jolene attempts to figure out where Hermes is keeping her money, eventually deducing it's inside her breast. Hermes states she's got 53 $20 bills in this side. Upon exiting the vehicle, Jolene hears a conversation, despite the fact that no one around her is talking. It's Hermes' voice, and the reason she can hear this conversation is due to the string coming from her finger that leads back to the vehicle. The guards attempt to confiscate Hermes' money as Jolene's hand unravels with string. The guard becomes more persistent, but Jolene uses a string to prevent him from whacking Hermes and to cut off his ear in the process. Jolene wonders if this was all just an illusion as she notices the money tied to her hand. What did my father, what did he give to me? It's 5.32 p.m. on October 28th. Jolene is seen in a car with a man named Romeo. Romeo has heard rumors of Jolene being part of a Hellrider gang. Jolene dispels this notion by saying she's never stole anything before. She then asks Romeo to call her Jojo. In an instant, something smashes into the windshield of the car, throwing them off of the road. They think it was a black mountain goat, but then they see glasses stuck in the windshield. Jolene sees a mangled body in a tree as she attempts to call an ambulance. Romeo urges her not to and recommends they move the corpse somewhere else. Cars start approaching them as Romeo begs for Jolene's help in moving the body. The two hide the body in the trunk of the car, with Romeo stating he'll take care of the rest. It is now November 2nd. Jolene is placed under arrest because her fingerprints were on an empty bottle inside the car. It is now November 8th. Jolene talks to her lawyer from the aquarium prison. The lawyer states that Romeo claimed that his car was stolen, so the police pin the incident on her. He instructs Jolene to accept the plea bargain, which would give her a grace period before going to prison, meaning she could up and leave the country. After mulling over the recommendation, Jolene pleads guilty in court. Unfortunately, she receives 15 years in prison. Confused by what just happened, Jolene feels like she was just betrayed. Outside the courtroom, we find out that the lawyer and Romeo were in cahoots. Jolene wonders if she's controlling the string, and if the other people can see it. She then curses Romeo for being sentenced for 15 years. A prison guard gives her a designation number of FE-40536. Jolene takes off her clothes upon command, and actually messes around with the guards a bit. During her inspection with the prison doctor, Jolene notices the lawyer outside. The lawyer acts as though he cares about Jolene's well-being. He then receives a letter from one of the guards from Jolene, and it says, This is not over yet. I'll get back to you, sooner or later. 
The lawyer turns on the air conditioning and starts choking as we see strings around his neck. He then crashes the car, causing severe injuries. Elsewhere, we see a mysterious prisoner with Jolene's amulet. Jolene pays the prison barber $30 to save all her hair. The prisoners line up to meet the prison manager, Rocco Barocco. An alligator hand puppet, Charlotte, is his assistant. She then explains the rules, stating they are not allowed to have metallic objects. After orientation, Jolene steals the pen from Rocco. She arrives at her cell to meet her new roommate. The roommate introduces herself as Guess and proceeds to attack Jolene, claiming that the bottom bunk is hers. Jolene sees the amulet sitting on the bed. She offers to buy it from Guess, but the girl says it will cost $200. But then she notices a bird coming up from Guess's pocket, a bird that has tiny human arms inside of it. In bed, Jolene thinks about the amulet from her father, as well as the strange bird that came from Guess's pocket. Guess then apologizes for the inappropriate behavior. She then allows Jolene to open the amulet, but not to keep it. There isn't anything inside, as the two cellmates decide to become friends. Jolene's pants are then soaking wet as she walks over to the cafeteria. She then finds out that all the food is sold out. Though prisoners are allowed to sleep in as long as they want, they risk missing breakfast. Jolene determines that Guess got her pants wet to steal her breakfast. In the trash, Jolene sees the picture of her parents, the one that was inside the amulet. Guess then plays with her pet bird. The bird repeats the words, I love you, and subsequently gets a treat. Jolene then switches the bird out for a banana via her ability. She determines that Guess must have received the abilities from the amulet. When Jolene looks inside the bird, tiny severed limbs of human body parts fall out. With Guess approaching, she hides behind a corner. Jolene deduces that Guess received the ability from the stone within the amulet. Blood then begins pouring from the walls. The bird's corpse then appears to be the same size as Jolene. Actually, in reality, Jolene has shrunk. Guess then walks in and grabs Jolene. She returns to her cell and throws Jolene at the desk. Guess has grown fond of Jolene and wants her help in escaping prison. Jolene asks about the person within the bird, but she throws a mouse corpse at her in anger. Guess forces Jolene into the corpse and starts training her. She places books on top of Jolene for her to lift up. Jolene cheats, causing Guess to become infuriated. Nevertheless, her demeanor changes as she compliments Jolene's spirit. Guess's stand is called Goo Goo Dolls. She commands Jolene to reach the control center in the prison in order to determine a means for escape. Jolene does as she's told, but once she reaches the place, her body begins to grow to normal proportions. This indicates that Guess's ability has a limited range of effectiveness. Because she left the mouse corpse, Go-Go Dolls chases her down. Jolene gets stuck between the bars as her body returns to normal. However, Goo Goo Dolls is not far behind, intending to kill her for leaving the mouse corpse behind. The stand attacks, but Jolene entangles it with her string. The stand rips through the string and wounds Jolene's hand. She manages to get through the bars, but the stand continues its pursuit. Jolene deduces the nature of stands and how they are manifestations of the user's will. She climbs onto the side of a wall, determining that this stand was responsible for her shrinking. Goo Goo Dolls leaps forward, gashing into Jolene's leg. She needs to find gas to eliminate the threat. As she starts to grow again, she gets entrapped between the bar and the wall. Goo Goo Dolls sets up for the kill, but is mysteriously sent flying back. He goes in again, but an arm pummels him once more. Jolene then notices her stand, protecting her. Jolene's strings come together to form a body. The stand squeezes Goo Goo Dolls, demanding Guess to reveal herself. Guess then appears in a wounded state. She then uses her powers to free Jolene from the pole. Jolene demands her amulet and wants to know where Guess got it from. She states she bought it from Hermes. She drops the amulet and uses this opportunity to punch Jolene, knocking her past the prison bars. Guess calls for a prison guard to apprehend her. A prison guard activates the alarm system after seeing Jolene pass the gate. Guess takes this opportunity to rub it in. Jolene Stan punches her in the face. Jolene names her Stan Stone Free as it rapidly punches Guess. When the guards show up, Jolene is nowhere to be seen. The guards attribute the incident to a newcomer's mistake. Given the young guards inexperience, Jolene begins to understand the limitations of her stand. Stone Free can travel far when unraveled, but it becomes weak and easily damaged. When clumped up, it forms a body with a range of 2 meters, more suited for strength. At the prison phones, a prisoner asks Jolene for a dollar so she can continue her call. When Jolene approaches another phone, she's knocked back by another prisoner. All the phones have been reserved, 
and she'll have to wait one month before using one. Guess seeks Jolene's forgiveness, but Jolene wants nothing to do with her. Guess advises her against giving away money, as it could damage her reputation. In the prison library, Jolene confronts the prisoner regarding her dollar. The girl blows up on her. Jolene is then asked for more money as she runs away to the bathroom. The prisoner experiences stomach pain as she rushes to the restroom. She offers to reimburse the dollar for the bathroom, but Jolene declines. She then offers $10 for the bathroom, to which Jolene accepts. Jolene acquires the money and then helps out another prisoner in getting money back too. She then sees a boy in a baseball uniform chasing a baseball. He warns her that someone will visit her tomorrow and she cannot go to see him no matter what. If she does, something worse than death will occur. Jolene looks away as the boy disappears. Jolene shouts for the guards to open up the gate, but they beat her down. Later on, the guard that beat her down apologizes and tells her she's got a visitor. After the guard explains the rules, Jolene waits for the visitor. The boy grabs her arm from a trash can, warning her about the visitor. Jolene ignores his warnings, so he hands her a strange looking bone. Jolene enters the room with the visitor, encountering a tall man in dark clothing. The man turns around. Revealing that he's Jolene's father, Jotaro Kujo. Jotaro inquires about the amulet that he gave her. Enraged that Jotaro is acting like a father, Jolene knocks out the guard. Jotaro then explains that he's here to break out Jolene from prison. A blind man finishes his shower. A guard alerts him that Jotaro Kujo has come to visit him. Jolene attempts to wake up the guard. Jotaro looks at a picture of the blind prisoner, John Gallier. He tells Jolene that it was him who set up the car accident. In fact, the thugs that threw the victim in front the car and the lawyer were all set up by John Gallier. It turns out that John Gali was a loyal follower of an old enemy of Jotaro's. So this is a form of revenge against the Cujo family. Jotaro instructs his daughter to escape prison with her stand. Despite this, Jolene hates her father and refuses to take instructions from him. She will thusly escape using her own means and without her father's help. Jotaro notices a fresh cigarette on the table, but it's different than the one that the guard smoked. A bullet then pierces Jolene's chest. Jotaro stops time with Star Platinum. Jolene uses Stone Free to create a string net around her chest, thus preventing the bullet from killing her. She is still sent flying back into the table though. A sniper has been waiting to kill them as Jotaro tells his daughter to put out the cigarette. She reluctantly complies. Jotaro postulates that John Gali A snuck in a sniper and is using his stand to send the bullets into the visiting room. Jolene inspects the bone that was given to her by the boy. Jotaro informs her that it's a female's pelvis bone, melted down with acid. He then catches a glimpse of John Gallier's stand, Manhattan transfer, gliding outside the room. Jotaro advises his daughter not to do anything, but she launches a string at the stand. It dodges, making her realize it reacts to air current. The knocked out prison guard wakes up and attempts to attack Jolene. She informs him about the danger, but he doesn't listen. Jotaro summons Star Platinum to knock away the guard, but one of John Gali's bullets hits his shoulder. Ironically, it goes through Jotaro and pierces the guard's head. Manhattan Transfer utilizes a satellite that senses their location. He thusly redirects the bullets to their location. The father and daughter remain still to avoid detection. John Gali prepares for his next shot. Because he can sense movement through the air current, he knows exactly where he hit Jotaro and the guard, though he wonders how Jolene survived a shot to the chest. He swears vengeance against the bloodline that robbed him of his quote-unquote heart support. Jolene uses her stand to hold a lighter by the smoke detector. Water rains down from the sprinklers, which should prevent Jangali's stand from detecting the air currents. Before Jangali attacks once more, the child arrives at the door, telling Jolene to kick the stone barrier underneath the pillar in the wall. After doing so, she sees a passageway through the sewers. Jotaro attempts to guide Jolene through the path, but she wants to protect the child that helped her. Jangali sets his sights on the child, who is helping the two. Jolene searches for the boy as she crawls through a hole in the wall. Once above the machining room, she sees Emporio, the boy, running away from something. Emporio enters a sewer pipe to avoid detection. Jangali hits the screws on the pipe, making it fall apart and revealing Emporio's location. Jangali sets his sights on the heart, but Stone Free wraps the net around Manhattan Transfer. Jangali then aims for Jolene's head, but he narrowly misses. It turns out that Jolene destroyed gas pipes, which created a separate airflow. Stone Free then 
punches Manhattan transfer, wounding the sniper. After finishing him off, Jolene asks Emporio who he is and about the bone that he gave her. He tells her to hold on to it. Once Jotaro enters, Jolene tells him that Manhattan transfer has been beaten. Despite this, she sees John Gali in the reflection of a puddle. She warns Jotaro that he's hiding in this room, but her father dispels this notion, saying it's impossible for him to move so fast. She says the sniper is directly above him, so Jotaro blows up the gas pipe with star platinum. A charge John Gali henceforth falls down. Jolene notices that Emporio has suddenly vanished once again. Jolene's wound disappears, and Jangali's body is actually the guard's body. In a shock, Jotaro doesn't even know who Jangali is. White goop then comes from the walls and the surfaces of the room. Jolene recalls the mysteriously lit cigarette, realizing she was hallucinating this entire time. She wakes up in the visiting room with everything covered in the white goop. Turns out the fight never happened, and the two have been hallucinating this entire time. Jolene sends a string towards her father, but it dissolves in midair. Stone Free breaks the table, stimulating Jotaro awake. Jolene commands him to summon Star Platinum to break her out. Jotaro wonders how she knows his Stan's name. He then realizes that he was hallucinating too. Jolene wraps strings around his face to wake him up. Jotaro punches Stone Free in the face, sending Jolene into the door and breaking it open. Jolene then pulls out her father and the guard into the hallway. The alarm goes off, alerting everyone to the incident. Jotaro informs his daughter they'll escape on a UUV, thanks to the Speedwagon Foundation. Jotaro goes over the plan of escape as they make their way to the exit. It. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure stalks the Kujos. The two navigate through the prison hallways. Jotaro tries to help her up, but she refuses his kindness. Jotaro clarifies he wasn't being kind. He just wants Jolene to be more careful with the amulet. Jolene remembers how cold he was as a father, but he doesn't empathize with her. She throws the amulet at him, telling him to have it if it's so important to him. Jotaro tells her to get down as the two guards appear from another hallway. One guard shoots the other in the head, revealing himself to be Jangalier. Jodoro instructs Jolene to flee, but Manhattan Transfer appears above Jolene. Jangali shoots at Jolene, but Star Platinum stops time, noticing another stand behind him. In fact, it's the ringleader of the operation, and they had planned on him to waste his time stop to protect his daughter. Time resumes and Jodoro saves his daughter. The lead stand then sends two discs through Jodoro's face. The mysterious stand, White Snake, gloats about taking Jodoro's disc. As Jangali shoots at Jodoro and Jolene, Jodoro stands motionless as Jolene uses Stone Free to deflect the bullets. Despite this, her dad is hit multiple times. Jolene breaks a window and tells her dad to get through it while the sniper reloads. Jotaro, however, is unresponsive. White Snake escapes behind a corner. Jotaro explains there's another stand and to take the amulet and escape to the beach. There's a transmitter in the amulet that will allow her to access the UUV. Jotaro then tells Jolene that he always cared for her. Jolene then realizes that her dad's stand was stolen. Jangali shoots at them, but Jolene uses her strings to redirect the bullets. She then tangles up Jangali and proceeds to beat him down with the flurry of punches, all too familiar. Jotaro feels confident in his daughter's abilities as he collapses to the ground. Jolene then looks for the UUV on the beach with her father passed out. The UUV then rises from the depths. She then pulls Jotaro's limpless body out of the water. She then wonders why he's so weak, considering that the water is shallow. But then why is his heart stopped? The guard dogs spot the two as Jolene screams. The guards look to use lethal force, but Jolene subdues them with her strings. Nevertheless, she puts up her hands, using a string to communicate with Emporio, who wonders why she didn't escape when she had the chance. White Snake's goal was to steal Jotaro's stand, which he did. Jolene says the killer went back inside the jail on purpose. Jolene aims to recover her dad's stand. Emporio states that the melted bone that he gave her earlier was his mother's, who died after being hypnotized by White Snake. Though Jotaro is not alive, he's not dead either, and Jolene is determined to bring him back to life. Guards then surround her from all angles. The tie-up loose ends, White Snake eliminates Jangali, realizing that he's got everything he ever wanted. As turbid as the bottom of the deep lake filled with corpses, this power can put people to sleep. Then when its gloop digests their body, it steals their hearts, and the man who possesses the power has chosen not to leave the prison. Who is he, and why is he trying to steal people's hearts inside the prison? At this point, I don't have any idea either, but he stole the heart of Kujo Jotaro, Jolene's father. Jolene needs to remain in prison to retrieve her father's stand and memory disc. For the incident, she's given an extra five years in prison and is sent in the solitary confinement. Hermes has money stolen while asleep. She wakes up in anger, but soon realizes she's in the prison sickbay. She remembers cutting herself on a strange amulet and then selling it to Guess. 
Afterwards, she got a high fever and spent six days in the sick bay. Hermes notices a strange pink sticker on her hands. She then notices that she has six fingers. She takes off the sticker, and her extra finger merges with the index finger, causing her extreme pain. The sticker lands on her bedpan, creating a duplicate version. This sticker! When I put this sticker on something, it turns one object into two, and when I take it off, it gets damaged. She then uses the sticker to get back at the janitor, who stole her money, by merging two mops in between his face. She looks to get her money back as she notices two discs stuck in his face. She looks at the disc she stole from the janitor, only increasing her confusion. The next day, Hermie is released from the sick bay. She asks the guards about the janitor, but they don't comply by answering her question. She looks into the disc, seeing a first-person view of someone hiding money in the courtyard. Whitesnake proposes an alliance with the thief, stating he has an evil that drags down others with him. The disc starts to go into Hermie's face, but she yanks it out. Meanwhile, McQueen, the janitor, has been fouled before, but never by a woman. Hermes asks about the disc, but McQueen starts crying. She asks about the money he stole, but he says he doesn't know where he hid it. McQueen cries profusely, making her wonder if he's okay. McQueen loves the idea that a woman cares about his well-being and states he would like to marry a woman like that someday. But when he realizes this will never come to pass, he hangs himself with his belt. Odd marks develop around Hermes' neck as she's pulled into the air. McQueen's evil is something to behold, bringing others down with him. The disc falls into the toilet. Because McQueen is hanging himself, his stand pulls Hermes into the air by her neck. She places a sticker at McQueen's belt, and when she takes it off, it merges back and breaks. Hermes wonders what's wrong with him. McQueen claims he's only approached her since she was investigating him. He hung himself because he's depressed coming to prison. Though, he acts as though he knows nothing about the stand. Next time he gets suicidal though, he'll see a doctor or a priest. He then proceeds to drown himself in the sink. His stand, Highway to Hell, begins drowning Hermes. She utilizes a sticker and mop to remove McQueen from the sink. Hermie instructs him to stay away as she grabs the disc out of the toilet. McQueen thinks the disc is his, wondering if she'll ever give it back. Hermes passes Emporio on her way to the female prison. He says stand users are drawn to each other as he chucks her a baseball. The ball passes through her and creates a divide in the wall. Emporio has been in this prison since birth, and he was instructed by Jolene to watch over Hermes. Emporio pulls her into the divide, reappearing in a room with a piano. Piano. At the piano is an unknown man and woman. Emporio says to ignore them. He then attempts to kill some cockroaches. This room is known as the ghost room, and a stand allows him to interact with the ghost objects. He proceeds to illuminate Hermes about the situation regarding Jolene and her father. Thus, he needs Hermes' help in tracking down Whitesnake. Hermes shows him the disc. He says stand abilities are implemented in these discs. Emporio says they should come in pairs, one for memories and the other for stands. Hermes' wrist is slit, due to McQueen trying to kill himself again. Her arm is then shocked with electricity. The electricity then disappears. Emporio figures McQueen would go after saline water. Hermes heads over to the medical wing, finding him wrapped up in electrical wires. He pours the water on himself. Hermes attempts to calm him down and informs him that his stand is injuring her. Four years ago, McQueen was cleaning his shotgun. The gun went off accidentally, killing a girl who was committing suicide. Unfortunately, the court ruled that the incident qualified as murder. Hermes henceforth offers her panties to cheer him up, which he considers. Hermes proceeds to improve his state of mind, but he realizes she's only doing this to save herself. She gets irate, telling him he's being used by Whitesnake. McQueen sarcastically says how wonderful she is and is looking forward to killing her. He then electrocutes the both of them. Hermes, however, placed a sticker on his face. After the electricity burns the sticker off, McQueen's faces merge back together, ejecting the disc from his head. Hermes takes the disc, deciding she needs to join Jolene's cause of taking down Whitesnake. In the prison's barn, two inmates attempt to escape a monster. The monster severs one of his arms and proceeds to eat him. At the female prison, Rocco tells the females that two prisoners have gone missing at the farm grounds, and they're currently searching for them. Jolene, Hermes, and three other prisoners volunteer to search for the prisoners. Bracelets are placed on them to ensure that they don't run away, otherwise they'll explode. Jolene asks Hermes about the disc at the farmland. Hermes is certain that the disc will return Jotaro's memories. They then watch the disc, which shows Whitesnake inserting a stand disc into McQueen. On the disc, a reflection of a tractor is seen. Surprisingly, inside the tire of the tractor is a collection of stand disc. Jolene deduces that Whitesnake is creating stand users. The two decide to investigate the tractor, determining that Jotaro's stand disc is likely there. A prison guard yells at them to stay on task. 
Hermes provokes the guard, causing him to whack her bracelet. The bracelet starts making a sound, so Hermes feigns being scared, telling the guard to turn it off. He knocks her back. Jolene puts a leaf under her as she lands on it and sends crocodile crap onto the guard's pants. The guard leaves as the two head to the barn. They find the tractor from the image on the disc, but two prisoners are already there. The guard announces that the duo has been found inside the swamp, giving Jolene and Hermes a small window to look into the wheel of the tractor. Hermes then wonders why there's six prisoners here when there were only supposed to be five. Another prisoner notices this too, so Hermes begins interrogating her. All of a sudden, all their bracelets start making a noise. The guard's gone! Where is he? Because the guard's body is washed away, it's causing the bracelets to make the noise. One of the prisoner's bracelets explodes. Jolene realizes that the extra person killed the guard since they got near the tractor. They locate the guard's body on the coast and decide to approach him. Hermes warns Jolene that one of the inmates is the enemy guarding the disc. Hermes suspects it's the one with the shaved head. As they approach the guard, Hermes notices a bucket filled with water. Hermes kicks the bucket, though it appears to be empty. Jolene joins the others. When she turns around, Hermes is gone, with only her shoe on the ground. Hermes is pulled into the water by something. An oddly shaped plankton swims in front of her face. It multiplies, eventually forming a body that chokes her. Hermes manages to reach the surface, warning Jolene to stay out of the water. Jolene creates a net to run on as she approaches Hermes. Stonefree punches a stand, but it catches her fist. The stand manipulates its hand to open up Stonefree's fist. The stand, Foo Fighters, punches Jolene in the abdomen, but she creates a hole in the spot that it punched. Stonefree proceeds to kick the stand in the face and pummel it with its fist. Hermes and Jolene then pull themselves to the coast. Foo Fighters then grabs Jolene's leg. Hermes places a sticker on the stand's arm. It comes off and destroys the stand's arm. The two reach land as Foo Fighters regenerates its arm and returns to the water. The other inmates use the guard's radio to contact the prison. Hermes tells them to stay away from the water as she reasons that one of them must be the stand user. Jolene then notices that one of them has a nosebleed. Hermes suspects that she's the stand user, but she claims that the tan inmate hit her, pointing at the blood on her hand. The inmates attempt to turn the tables on Hermes, so Jolene punches the nosebleeder in the face, knocking her out cold. She proceeds to knock them all out, but the inmate with the shaved head stops her. All the inmates' eyes go black as they begin to communicate in unison. They mention the white snake and how they'll be kept alive so he can steal their stands. Stonefree punches them out as they all melt into a black goop. The tan prisoner melts into Foo Fighters, explaining that it created the body out of the missing prisoners. The other two were possessed when inspecting the tractor. In Foo Fighters' head are two discs, stating that it is tasked with guarding White Snake's stand discs. Determining that Foo Fighters is its own user, Jolene says they need to stay away from the water. Foo Fighters then invokes Fred Hoyle's theories to explain his own sentience. Despite being a mass plankton, he then runs towards the barn to hide the discs. The double makes its way to the guard in order to force the bracelets to explode. Jolene instructs Hermes to take care of the double as she runs to the barn. Kiss charges the double as Hermes uses a sticker to duplicate her arm, which allows her to grab the guard and run towards the barn. The double gets her wet, allowing it to move on to her. Jolene's bracelet beeps louder and louder. The double then pins Hermes against the ground. Since the double needs water to move, Hermes applies a sticker and removes it from the inmate's corpse, creating a burst of dust that dries out the double. Hermes breaks free and heads towards the barn. Jolene then encounters Foo Fighters as he holds the tire that's filled with discs. Water sprays all over the barn as Foo Fighter and Jolene stare each other down. Jolene inquires Foo Fighter if he knows the identity of White Snake. It replies that it doesn't know much. Jolene lashes out with Stone Free as she attempts to sneak a string past the stand. Foo Fighter notices this as it merges with the puddle on the floor. It then combines with Jolene, believing it created the ideal environment for itself. Despite this, Jolene predicted this outcome, using the string as a distraction. It turns out she used another string to start the tractor, where the discs are located. While Foo Fighter was engaged with Jolene, the tractor went out in the field, where Hermes could catch up to it. Foo Fighter heads towards the tractor. Unfortunately for the stand, the dry fields evaporate its body, leaving little left when it reaches the tractor. Hermes looks for a finishing blow with a pile of dirt, yet Jolene attempts to save it, reasoning that it was protecting the disc in order to protect its own identity. 
She offers Foo Fighters to join their alliance if he goes against Whitesnake, to which he agrees. Jolene inserts her father's stand disc into her forehead. She possesses Star Platinum for a brief moment, but the disc ejects itself. Due to it being too powerful for her, she is thrilled that she can save her father now. Hermes states that they also need the memory disc to save her father. Foo Fighters possesses Atro's corpse so that he can protect Jolene while on land. Foo Fighter then drinks the water off the floor. It turns out that White Snake stores the stand disc that he doesn't need in the barn. Jotaro's stand disc is too powerful for most people, and it only works for someone with the right potential, which means that Star Platinum is nearly worthless to anyone else, since few have the potential to wield it. White Snake only wanted Jotaro's memory disc. The guards arrive at the farm as Foo Fighter hides Jotaro's disc in his overalls. The guards henceforth take them back to the prison. Later on, White Snake thinks about Jolene. Though she was intended to be the bait to catch Jotaro, White Snake wonders if she's becoming too powerful. He deduces that Hermes and Natro helped her out in defeating Foo Fighters. The guards tell the priest, White Snake's user, that the sun is setting and that they should head back to the prison. In the prison courtyard, Foo Fighter watches a prisoner playing catch. He henceforth searches for a baseball. Hermes inquires about Jotaro's stand disc. Jolene says only Foo Fighters knows where it is. An inmate starts drinking water from Foo Fighter's cup. Foo Fighter tells him to stop, but thinking Foo Fighter is Atro, he ignores her. Foo Fighter uses his stand power to force the water out of the man, dislocating his jaw in the process. Foo Fighter retrieves her cup and continues playing with Jolene. Inside the prison, Father Enrico Pucci talks to an inmate, Mirashan. Thanks to the priest, she has changed her life around. He asks about the difference between man and animal, but gets distracted by consuming a pair of cherries whilst leaving the seeds intact. He then indicates that the difference is that man has a desire to go to heaven, something animals cannot fathom. Pucci says he'll put in a good word for her with the warden. She attempts to thank him, but he proceeds to slam her face against the desk. He takes back the cross she stole and places two discs into her with White Snake. Meanwhile, Jolene attempts to show Foo Fighters how to throw a ball. She throws it erratically as it heads towards Mirashan's head. Jolene nabs it before it makes contact. Mirashan elbows her in the side and then makes a bet that if Jolene catches the ball 100 times, she'll give her $100. Since they've already caught the ball 87 times, they only need to do it 13 more times. Jolene passes on the offer, though Foo Fighters encourages her to take the bet. But Jolene still refuses, telling Mirashan to go away. Hermes offers to throw the ball, but Jolene fears Mirashan is a stand user sent by White Snake. Hermes states he'll need the money to get Jotaro's stand disc out of prison. Jolene throws the ball to Foo Fighters, accepting the bet. The two throw the ball with no problems until Foo Fighters throws it erratically. Luckily, Jolene manages to pull it in. Foo Fighters thinks Mirashan is sitting too close to her water cup, which distracts her. Though she catches the ball, she yells at Mirashan. Hermes grabs Foo Fighters' cup and fiercely tells her to throw the ball. Foo Fighter throws, but a basketball hits Jolene from behind. Though the ball travels past her, she manages to get in position by propelling herself with some string. They continue the exercise until they reach 100. The three ask for their money, yet Mirashan challenges them to do it again, this time for $1,000. Jolene doesn't trust Mirshan, turning down the bet. But Hermes accepts it immediately. Hermes instructs Jolene to serve as the lookout as Foo Fighter and her play catch. The two successfully catch the ball 30 times, but the guard informs them that it's time to go back inside. Foo Fighter frees her arm and throws it to Hermes. Hermes requests that they place the bet on hold until tomorrow, but Mirshan does not allow this. Hermes throws the ball to Foo Fighters and bribes the guard to give him an extra few minutes. In the middle of her throw, the guard confiscates the glove, saying that the bribe only covers the ball. Hermes uses Kiss's stickers to help her catch the ball. She continues throwing the ball, but she's fully cognizant of the fact that she cheated. The deck collector stand appears, taking the money hidden within Hermes' breast. It amounts to $380. Since the bet between the two was $1,000, the stand takes her golden tooth, which is only worth 30 bucks. Hermes attempts to put up resistance, but nothing can stop Marilyn Manson from collecting its debt. Foo Fighters attacks the debt collector, but it takes no damage. Marilyn Manson steals Hermes' liver, determining that it could pay off the rest of the debt if it is sold to the black market. Because Hermes admitted to cheating in her heart, the stand will collect the debt and it cannot be stopped, no matter what. Jolene challenges Marilyn Manson to another bet. 1,000 consecutive catches for everything that was taken from Hermes. Hermes offers $5,000 for everything that was taken, but Marilyn Manson knows that the money belongs to McQueen, so he declines the offer. Jolene and Foo Fighters start to throw the ball, but Foo Fighters doesn't think they have enough time to make it happen. Jolene says they don't need to win the bet, but to beat Mirashan. Mirashan enters the prison 
to distance herself from the girls, but they enter in, whilst continuing to throw the ball. They walk through the showers, yet Mirshan turns off the lights mid-throw. Foo Fighters begins to panic. Jolene tells her to calm down, telling her to stay still. The ball hits Foo Fighters in the face, and thanks to her ability, she manages to catch it. Jolene tells Foo Fighters to turn on the lights and to throw the ball towards the sound of her voice. Yet, all Foo Fighter hears is Mirshan's mumbling. Using her ability, she shoots in the general direction of Mirshan, tearing her arm to shreds. In a panic, Mirshan runs out of the showers. Jolene and Foo Fighters pursue her whilst throwing the ball. As they run into the main prison, the PA announces that the main lockdown will begin soon. Mirshan then enters a room. Jolene attempts to corner her, but the room is actually an elevator. It begins to close, with Foo Fighters on the outside. Foo Fighters barely manages to open the door. She throws the ball at the elevator. Jolene unravels the ball using stone free. This permits it to fit through the elevator gate. Jolene claims she didn't cheat, as Deck Collector hasn't shown up. She now has 10 seconds to beat Mirashan's ass. Jolene commands Mirshan to disable Marilyn Manson and to return Hermes' liver. Mirshan begs for mercy, but Jolene squeezes her neck, telling her to hurry up. Marilyn Manson proceeds to return the liver, but when Jolene asks for the money back, a guard takes the ball from her. It turns out he was paid off by Mirshan to interfere with their game of catch. Jolene prepares Stone Free, but Marilyn Manson attacks her first. The debt collector steals her organs. Additionally, he takes Jodoro's stand disc from Foo Fighters. Mirshan gloats in victory, but Jolene chucks the baseball at her face. Using her string, she throws the ball at Mirshan 1,000 times, in accordance with their bet. With the stand defeated, all the items are returned. Jolene says she'll take the memory disc from Whitesnake as she walks away. Jolene then pays an inmate to give her the phone as she calls the Speedwagon Foundation. They retrieve Jotaro's body, but detect no signs of life. She has a method in which to revive him, but she'll need their help in getting the disc out of the prison. They inform her to go to the prison courtyard in 20 minutes, with the disc in hand, and they'll retrieve it from her. He tells her to look for Savage Garden. Emporio helps Jolene to the courtyard. He takes her to the music room, where a man named Weather Report is waiting. Emporio uses a map to show Jolene where she needs to go. To assist her, Weather Report decides to join. Apparently, Weather has no memories prior to entering prison. His stand, also named Weather Report, can control the weather. He creates a puddle, revealing that an enemy is stalking them. The three rush out of the room, but the unknown adversary follows them. Jolene wants to fight it, but Emporio tells her not to. The lane wrangler spits onto the ground, which increases his speed. He then spits on the Jolene. The three turn the corner and hide within the ghost room. Lane continues searching for them as he walks away. Emporio says that Weather will enter the factory first and meet up with Jolene. Then they'll enter the courtyard by force and give the stand disc to the Speedwagon Foundation. Jolene bribes her way into the factory. Nevertheless, the money floats back to Jolene. A cup and saucer also attract themselves to Jolene. As she runs into the factory, she gets suspended in mid-air. Everything she touches gets suspended into mid-air. The stand disc floats away as Jolene attempts to retrieve it. Because of the zero gravity, she can't control her string. Lang then appears, maneuvering his body over to Jotaro's disc. Jolene attempts to grab the disc, but Lang blows the string off course. He then snatches the disc and breaks it in half. However, the disc fixes itself, returning to its pristine form. Realizing it cannot be destroyed, Lang will take it back to Whitesnake, leaving Jolene to float around in zero gravity. Jolene throws a cup through the doorway. She attaches a string to it and uses it to call for Weather Report's help. Weather appears, chasing after Lang. Lang summons Jumpin' Jack Flash, which shoots screws and bolts towards Weather. Weather utilizes his stand to deflect the objects. Weather's stand phases through Jumpin' Jack's punches. The resulting friction sparks a fire on Lang and his stand's arms. Lang releases a zero gravity on the object, causing it to fall onto Weather. The alarms are then triggered, causing the gates in the hallway to close off, trapping them all inside. Lang maneuvers through the zero gravity room to escape with Jotaro's stand disc. Weather Report grabs Jolene as she panics. Though he's weightless, Weather uses his stand to push through the gate. The two then fly into the factory. Weather thinks he knows where Lang is hiding and how they could get to the courtyard. Problem is, Jolene has to pee. Turns out it's a natural effect of zero gravity, and he's already pissed in the corner. She then notices the urine floating upward. In addition to this, the blood from her nose is going upward. Weather's wound bleeds as it goes towards the cracks in the wall. From the other room, Lang shoots his projectiles at Jolene, but she deflects them with stone free. Everything that Jolene touches loses its weight, including the air. As a result, Jolene and Weather start to suffocate in the room. Father Enrico asks about the disturbance in the hallway. The security guards are unsure at this time, since there are no cameras in the hallway. The father ensures them that he has complete faith in the 
prisoners and the staff. Pucci then inspects a computer screen displaying outgoing calls. He then requests to listen to the call that went to the Speedwagon Foundation. In the factory, all the objects that lost their weight are being sucked into the walls. Jolene worries about suffocating to death, but Weather Report explains that their blood will boil long before that happens. Jolene deflects more projectiles with Stone Free. Weather grabs Jolene and creates cloud suits that permit them to breathe. Weather then hides behind machinery, luring Lang in to come search for them. The air in the cloud suits will only last two minutes though, as Lang goes back into hiding. Jolene determines that Lang's stand has a limited range, which means Lang is hiding over there so that he can breathe. Weather heads over, yet Lang attacks from behind. Stone Free deflects most of the projectiles, but one still hits Weather's leg. The air sucks out of Weather's suit, with Lang launching more projectiles. Jolene deflects them with her stand again. Weather resumes flying to the edge of the zero gravity zone. Lang then focuses his attacks on the barrel of air. He pierces the barrel, sending it flying towards Weather. Weather is sent flying, and nearly has his suit destroyed in the process. Lang resumes attacking, yet Jolene continues to deflect them. The projectiles then hit some rats, splattering the blood on Jolene, thus blocking her vision. Lang then pierces Jolene's suit with more projectiles. Jolene and Weather are now motionless in midair, rushing towards their death. Lang starts to feel himself after his victory, as he considers killing Whitesnake next. Despite this, string is wrapped around his body. It turns out that Jolene used the screws that hit her to tether the string. And, actually, the screws didn't even hit her. Jolene connected the string amongst Lang's ammo. She then pulls Lang towards her, into the vacuum. Lang's blood starts to boil. However, he mixes peroxide with magnesium dioxide, thus creating oxygen. He then throws the bottle at Jolene. After bursting, it destroys her cloud suit. Weather then decides to give her his suit, before she dies. Lang turns off to zero gravity, which forces in a burst of air. The air, unfortunately for him, pushes him towards Stone Free. Jolene proceeds to pummel him as she takes back Jodoro's disc. Jolene then asks how they'll get to the courtyard from here. Weather states there's a revolving door that they need to get through. Jolene says they'll use Lang's pass in order to open the door, which should fool the guard. Jolene scans the entry pass and displays Lang's helmet to the camera. A voice then wonders if this is Lang knocking. The door opens ever so slightly, with Father Pucci on the other side. Thinking he's talking to Lang, he tells Jolene to come to the chapel with him. There is no reply though. Pucci then takes a look, seeing Jolene instead of Lang. Pucci attempts to set off the alarm, yet Jolene persuades him not to. Pucci then wonders why she used Lang's pass. Jolene claims she was assaulted by Lang and fought him off in self-defense. She requests to go to the courtyard for a minute. He asks if she's alone, and she says yes. Though, she's lying about this, because Weather is hiding behind a barrel. Pucci believes that an act of kindness without the expectation of reward is the pathway to heaven, leading him to open the door for her. Though Pucci realizes that someone is hiding behind the barrel. But, if he allows her to pass, they won't suspect him of being Whitesnake. Jolene reaches the courtyard with a lone man standing in the center. The man is a guard, asking her if she is permitted to be here. She attempts to answer, but the guard fires a bullet into her abdomen. We then see a disc inserted in the back of the guard's head. Pucci now recalls a conversation he had with an old friend back in 1988. A friend that could stop time. But it was I, Dio! There might be a way to go to heaven, says Dio. However, the heaven that I am talking about pertains to the human mind, where your spirit will go. True happiness lies there if one is able to go to heaven. Dio claims he'll get there, no matter the sacrifice. His findings were inscribed in a notebook, but it burned up in Egypt in 1989. Jotaro read the contents of that notebook, and henceforth burned it. But with Jotaro's memories in Pucci's possession, he now has the means to access that information. Jolene lies on the ground after being shot by the guard. Weather wants to help, but is too badly injured. Pucci decides to let the guard handle Jolene as he heads towards the chapel. Outside, the guard says, It's over, Jolene Cujo. A blue frog leaps onto his hand, altering the trajectory of the bullet. Turns out that Weather can make poisonous frogs rain down into the courtyard. The frog's toxin seriously injures the guard. A couple break through the prison windows, landing next to Pucci. The priest knows the frogs are extremely deadly, using White Snake to keep them away. However, Pucci's ID card falls underneath the frogs, trapping him inside the room. He deduces this is the handiwork of Weather. Jolene creates a net to prevent the frogs from touching her. Unfortunately, the frogs' toxins start to seep through. 
To calm himself down, Pucci begins counting prime numbers. He calls for the guard he controlled, but he arrives with horrible deformities. He walks towards Pucci, but is knocked down by the reigning frogs. Pucci instructs another guard to open the gate, but he runs away in fear. Pucci creates a disc, kicks a frog in midair, and throws a disc into the frog. He tells the frog to explode in 10 seconds. After doing so, its fluids explode onto the guard's face. After falling down, Pucci goads the guard into heading towards him. Pucci then uses his ID card to open the gate, as he wonders what he should do with Jodoro's disc. Meanwhile, the toxic fluid continues seeping through Jolene's net. White Snake enters the courtyard, looking for Jotaro's stand disc. White Snake stumbles upon Jolene's body and discovers the disc nearby. Jolene then uses a string net to grab the disc. Turns out she used the frogs to cover herself, and she's completely safe as long as they don't explode. White Snake starts a lethal attack. We then find out that the Speedwagon Messenger was, in fact, a pigeon named Savage Garden, which Jolene attached the disc to with her stand. White Snake grabs a gun to shoot at the pigeon. Unfortunately, it's out of bullets. White Snake then runs off as Jolene attaches a string to him to discover who his stand user is. White Snake then returns to Poochie. Despite the mishap, the priest doesn't need the stand disc to make his plans come to fruition. We then find out that Foo Fighters does the opposite of what Atro does to try to prevent bullying. It doesn't work though, but when the inmates start a fight, Jolene and her steal their food. Foo Fighters tells Jolene that Hermes intentionally went to prison. Turns out, her sister Gloria was murdered after witnessing an incident outside her father's restaurant. The one responsible was Sports Max. Due to a lack of evidence, however, he was only sentenced to five years of prison. Shortly afterwards, her father died, and she lost the restaurant. With nothing left to her name, except for anger and sorrow, she purposefully entered prison to seek out revenge against Sports Max. We then see Hermes in the chapel, watching Sports Max talk to Father Pucci. Turns out she's been stalking him the past few days. She's recorded everything he's done, and all the places that he visits. While she follows Sports Max, Jolene and Foo Fighters follow her. Jolene believes Hermes should handle this alone, but still doesn't want her friend to be murdered. The two cease their chase when they see her stop her pursuit. Sports Max then notices a photo of Gloria stuck to the wall. He grabs it, which pleases Hermes. She wants Gloria to be his last memory before he dies. Since the photo was held up by one of Kiss's stickers, the pipe it was attached to merges with its duplicate, trapping Max inside. He suffocates inside the pipe, but he summons his stand, Limp Biscuit, before he dies. A glass jar filled with water then breaks open. An invisible bird walks through the puddle and proceeds to attack Hermes. The bird pecks and claws at her face. Her stand misses the target as the bird flutters about. The bird then pulls out a vein. She duplicates her jacket and covers the bird with it. She then proceeds to crush it with her stand. Hermes deduces that Max must have received his stand from Whitesnake. But since Max has no involvement with Jolene or her father, he must have had a different purpose for acquiring the stand. She kicks the pipe that Max is in. Surprisingly, something starts moving on the ground. A stuffed crocodile then charges her, forcing her to run away. She jumps on a pipe for safety. Jolene and Foo Fighters come in, wondering what's going on. The crocodile proceeds to bite off Foo Fighters' legs. Hermes says an invisible crocodile zombie is attacking them. The gator devours the leg and sets his sights on Jolene. Jolene splashes Foo Fighters' blood onto another zombie, allowing her to see it. She summons Stone Free, but the gator whacks her away with its tail. She then senses the gator's movements via a net of strings on the floor. Hermes elucidates them about what's going on, but instructs them to run away. The invisible gator then climbs down the wall to attack Jolene's shoulder. Having her leg bitten off is invested in this battle as she jumps in front of Jolene. The gator bites her hand, but this allows her to unleash her attack inside its mouth. After killing the zombie creature, she attempts to put her leg back together. Hermes investigates the pipe where Max is, but it bursted open with no signs of his body anywhere. Max wanders down the prison hallway, in the need of something to drink. He goes to the chapel in search of the body White Snake told him about. But first, he heads over to one of his girls, placing his hands on her. Upset, she needs another inmate in the chest, who touched her without paying. Max then beats him up. Hermes looks at the pipe, finding a pair of handprints on the side. Hermes says the alligator was not a ghost, but probably a living corpse. She tells Jolene that Max has an ulterior motive, and it probably has to do with her father's memories. Meanwhile, Max drags the man's body while invisible, finding money hidden in his sleeve. He strips the man's clothing, finding a syringe that he proceeds to inject himself with. Sewer water pours out of Max's body. He then eats the brains of the girl. I wasn't thirsty. I wanted to eat brains. 
Jolene and Hermes stumble upon the girl's corpse in the graveyard. The gate closes as Jolene summons Stone Free for protection. Jolene sets up a string barrier all around them to pinpoint Max's location. A string bends, so Jolene kicks his arm, but his wrist spins around as he grabs her foot. He pulls her upward, but Jolene summons Stone Free, which unravels the string to wrap around the zombie. She punches him to death, causing the prostitute's corpse to burst. Hermes realizes this was just Max's girlfriend. The real Max knocks Jolene into a pillar. Hermes tells Jolene to leave, but Jolene can't let her fight alone. Just then, she points to the cemetery as invisible zombies of former inmates crawl towards them. And these zombies are hoping to feast on some brains. Jolene and Hermes decide to flee, but the latter wants to stay to experience her revenge. The string barrier is torn apart as multiple zombies head towards them. Jolene tells Hermes to run, but Hermes isn't leaving anytime soon. Zombies bite at Hermes' arms as she doesn't waver in her resolve. A zombie bites a chunk of Hermes' head. Nevertheless, this was a duplicate created by her sticker. With Max's location identified, she attacks him with Kiss. Max, however, detaches his head from his body, and since Hermes aimed for his body, she completely misses. Max proceeds to pull off the sticker on her head, causing it to merge with the duplicate. Though, this was part of her plan, as the proxy head tears through Max and returns to her. She then kicks him in the face, and dislocates his jaw with her stand. She then duplicates his head, immediately pulling off the sticker, causing it to merge together. Kiss then beats him to death. The zombies henceforth disappear as Hermie collapses to the ground. Jolene is then sent to the Ultra Security Punishment Ward due to all the unexplained deaths happening in her presence. All of her privileges have been restricted. She is then thrown into a new cell, which looks rather dismal. Her one daily meal consists of an infested loaf of bread. Despite this, she remains resolute in saving her father. In the chapel, White Snake talks about philosophy with Max. He says that as a human population increases, the rest of the world's life decreases proportionally. He questions Max how it feels to harness the power of the dead. He then presents to him a bone in order to revive it. Max is unsure if he can revive something from just a piece of a corpse, but White Snake threatens to take his discs away. Max has already revived it as White Snake sees a hole in his hand. Poochie screams in agony as his hand starts bleeding. White Snake wants Max to find the bone, but then decides to wait and see what the bone does next. Max thinks it's heading to the Ultra Security Prison. This is the end of the memory, as the memory disc ejects from Emporio. Jolene has already seen this, hence the reason she wanted to get sent to the Punishment Ward. Foo Fighter wants Emporio to save Jolene from White Snake, but it's impossible since he can't go to the ward. At the piano is a man named Anasu, yet Emporio claims that he'd never help. Ever since Anasu was a child, he enjoyed taking things apart. At 21, he found his girlfriend cheating on him and immediately took them apart so they could never come together again. As a result, he was sent to prison. As it turns out, weather helps maintain his temper. Otherwise, no one knows what would happen. Anasu agrees to help, in hopes that he can marry Jolene one day. He proceeds to kick down a door with a stand, drive her down. Guards open up the door from the other side, but are kicked down by the stand's legs. Inside Jolene's dark cell, a guard shines a floodlight on her. She proceeds to hide under the bed from the brightness. Turns out he did this because the guards had a wager on what she'd do. Jolene stands up, angering the guard, so he proceeds to spray her down. The guard holding the hose gets the others wet, instigating a fight amongst them. Jolene is unsure what to make of this. After winning the fight, Westwood formally announces a brawl to all those in the punishment ward. Elsewhere, Poochie realizes that Max is gone. He then wonders how Jolene will be killed by the four stand users in the ward before she attains Dio's bone. In the past, Poochie asked Dio which stand is the most worthless. Though Dio didn't believe any stand was worthless, the worst would probably be Survivor. He recounts a story of six people hiking in the mountains. Before ascending, they got in a fight with a lodge owner. After leaving, they climbed up the mountain, got in a fight, and brutally murdered each other. The lone survivor bled out before he could reach the bottom of the mountain. Survivor's ability makes all those around you fight to the death. Poochie asks if he could store the stand disc for future endeavors. In the punishment ward, under the effect of the survivor stand, Westwood releases all the inmates so that they can all fight. Jolene skirts out, focusing on finding Dio's bone even if she has to kill someone in the process. This new mindset shocks her. Westwood then charges her. Stone free attacks, but he dodges. 
Westwood then runs into the wall to take Jolene's backside. She grabs his legs with her strings. Despite this, thanks to Survivor, he can see her strengths and weaknesses. Anasu and Foo Fighter use their stands to sneak through the halls to reach Jolene. Foo Fighters assumes the leadership role and states they need to defeat White Snake's minions before they get to Jolene. Anasu accepts the terms, provided he gets to marry Jolene. Meanwhile, Jolene and Westwood square off. Both are able to see each other's strengths and weaknesses. In addition, both experience a rise in their physical capabilities. Jolene blocks the first attack and punches him in the jaw. Stone Free traps Westwood within her strings, proceeding to pummel him. She goes in for the fatal blow, but then her elbow gets blown away. Westwood has a stand disc sticking out of his head. In the prison chapel, Poochie worries about Jolene's heightened abilities due to the survivor, but feels confidence in the stand users he sent to finish her off. Jolene backs off, clutching her left arm to halt the bleeding. She then sews up the wound with her strings. She dodges the next attack and kicks him in the face. He charges in once more. Jolene forces him to punch his other arm with her string. She then proceeds to tie up his arms. She places his jacket on him and punches him in the face. As she pummels the guard with her fist, a part of her leg gets blown off. Westwood uses this opportunity to take her back and put a chokehold in. Jolene looks up, seeing several holes in the ceiling. Fear overcomes her as she begins to understand how Westwood attacks. Jolene desperately attempts to escape the chokehold. Westwood specializes at detaining prisoners and he's become very adept over the years. She proceeds to pierce his eyes and ears with her strings. Unfortunately, two meteors rain into the prison. She moves the strings in such a fashion only to get scraped by the meteor. The other one heads towards Westwood's face, yet burns up before it can hit him. Westwood's stand, Planet Waves, is able to pull meteors towards him, burning them up just before impact. Jolene peels off the top of his big toe, claiming she'll skin his entire body before the meteors come. The pain of having his skin peeled forces him to lose his grip. She then deflects the meteors heading towards her with Stone Free. Yet, they burn up before hitting Westwood. Jolene's body is covered in severe wounds. Confident in his powers, Westwood entices Jolene to hit him. As he goads her, Jolene notices an inmate picking up a mysterious bone. Westwood makes his advance, backing her into a wall. Jolene narrowly dodges the oncoming meteors, but her face moves into a kick from Westwood. A final meteor heads towards her head, yet Jolene is determined to achieve her goals, believing she'll see the stars. As a meteor approaches, Jolene is knocked back by Westwood's kick. She tries to grab his leg, but he kicks her off. She falls into the meteor, but grabs Westwood's boot off his foot, allowing her to protect herself from the direct impact. The meteor and boot are sent flying to Westwood. Although the meteor burns up, the flaming boot comes in at full force. Stone Free headbutts Westwood, causing him to fall and lose consciousness. She thinks about Dio's bone as all the inmates blow up and fall to the ground. It appears the fight is over. Despite this, a 78-year-old man, Kenzo, marvels at Jolene's valor and fighting spirit. Jolene proceeds to tell him off in multiple languages. Kenzo says he drowned the other prisoners and he needs to finish off Foo Fighters before killing Jolene. Foo Fighters was hiding in one of the prisoners' bodies and tries to shoot the old man with her bullets. Kenzo is unaffected, as a bloated body serves as a shield. Foo Fighters says she'll heal Jolene's injuries after she's finished off the old man. Anasu walks in as Jolene wonders who he is. Kenzo summons a cryptic dragon compass. He uses it to predict her attacks. He then goes on the offensive with a punch that starts to drown her. His attack targets the adrenal glands, which gives the feeling of being suffocated by a giant wave. Foo Fighters punctures her own throat, releasing the adrenal fluid and giving her a chance to shoot Kenzo. Kenzo easily dodges and proceeds to kick her in between the stairwell. Due to her transformation, she's not badly injured. Kenzo questions her humanity, but she merely grunts in a response. Jolene wants to provide assistance, but Anasu says it's paramount that they analyze Kenzo's abilities before they attack. Though Kenzo is mad and drinks his own piss, he used to be a cult leader who killed 34 people in a mass suicide, thus receiving 280 years in prison. He was the only survivor in the cult. In fact, it was like the building was trying to protect him. Kenzo uses his ability to sense that Foo Fighters has an odd organism in her body. He then performs feng shui based movements to summon his stand. Foo Fighters shoots it, but it states it won't do a thing and that he is neutral. Because the stand is intangible, Foo Fighters focuses her attention on Kenzo. The old man leaps at Foo Fighters. She manages to dodge and punches him rapidly. Nevertheless, he blocks all her attacks. 
He then leaps in the dragon's dream, his stand. His arm comes off and flies towards Foo Fighters. She blocks the attack. As the arm returns to Kenzo, Dragon's Dream warns Foo Fighters of impending danger, believing it's unfair that Kenzo is keeping his abilities a secret. A door then closes on the bloated inmate's head. His glasses are crushed, and pieces fly straight into Foo Fighter's mouth. Jolene and Anasu closely observe the fight. Anasu believes Kenzo's abilities has to do with Feng Shui. Essentially, he's determining lucky and unlucky spots, and using them to his advantage. And it's thanks to years of dedication that his stand can pinpoint all the lucky spots. Because of this, it seems that Foo Fighters is facing an insurmountable challenge in fighting Kenzo's feng shui. Jolene tells Foo Fighters about Kenzo's stand, so Kenzo scolds Dragon's Dream for revealing too much. The Dragon proceeds to tell Foo Fighters about her unlucky spots. Kenzo attacks from behind, but Foo Fighters kicks the old man. Despite this, he strikes her lower neck. As a result, her mouth opens up, allowing him to stick his hand inside. Before he activates her adrenal gland, Foo Fighters bites down and kicks him away. Kenzo, however, manages to kick her into Dragon's Dream. Her arm then separates from her body. It then goes into a bloated prisoner and then returns. Dragon's Dream explains that she's in an unlucky spot, and that she needs to minimize the damage of the next attack as best as she can. Two bugs fly upwards as a bird swoops down and catches one. The bird flies into the exhaust fan, causing it to fall to pieces. One of the blades falls like a boomerang towards Foo Fighters, slicing open her skull. Anisu says there's no way to defend against unlucky spots. Jolene warns Foo Fighters that she's running out of water. After Kenzo thinks Foo Fighters is dead, he turns his attention to Jolene. Nevertheless, Foo Fighters shoots at him and hits him, due to the fact that he moved into the unlucky spot. She'll need a mirror to force Kenzo out of his lucky spot. Kenzo then thinks about his days as a cult leader, and how he'll get people to respect him once again. Foo Fighters flips backwards to avoid Kenzo's kick. She then runs towards a hose as Jolene instructs Anasu to help her. He refuses, claiming he's only here to help Jolene. Foo Fighters attempts to turn the hose on, but Dragon's Dream appears underneath it. She's in an unlucky spot. She punches the dragon, but both of her arms come off. Kenzo kicks at her, yet she enters the fire hose to avoid the hit. She kicks open the faucet, dousing the whole area in water. Her arms return to punch her as she's sent away from the water. She then falls into the execution chamber. The hose gets entangled in a mechanism, activating the electric chair. She attempts to escape, but her overalls get stuck in the chair. She gets them untangled, but then notices her ankle is trapped. Foo Fighters manages to get loose as Kenzo approaches her. She takes a shot at him, but it does next to no damage. She slips on the blood, sending her flying back into the chair. Kenzo then kicks her back into the chair when she attempts to get out. She's then jilted with 2800 volts of electricity. Dragon's Dream warns him that when he kicked her, his sweat became her water. She uses to create a mirror reflection on Dragon's Dream, which means that Kenzo is in an unlucky spot. Foo Fighters grabs Kenzo to shock him with 2800 volts. Anasu encourages Jolene to find the bone now, since Kenzo is defeated. He recommends that they leave Foo Fighter behind, but Jolene jumps into the chamber. Dragon's Dream, however, is still there, meaning Kenzo is alive. Jolene unravels her string to attack, but the old man manages to dodge it. Jolene now knows where the lucky spot is. In this spot is a puddle with a few plankton making up Foo Fighters. She returns these back to Atra's body. Kenzo charges in with his feng shui, but Jolene enters Dragon's dream with her strings. Kenzo puts his feet in Jolene's mouth, but he's sent into a staircase. He questions Dragon's dream why his last attack failed. He asks where the unlucky spot is as he falls off the railing. He's then launched into a wall after hitting the ground. Dragon's dream then sees Diver Down embedded within his body. Turns out that Diver Down took apart Kenzo's leg bones and put them back together in a fashion that would act as a spring. Kenzo's body then collapses, landing in a bucket. Meanwhile, the Speedwagon Foundation watches over the conscienceless Jotaro. Though they take care of him, he has no will to live, and his muscles are deteriorating. Star Platinum swings at a doctor who tries to touch his head. He smashes his IV, sustaining wounds in the process. The cuts from the wounds then form the word Jolene. At the prison, Jolene recalls a time when she found a wallet on the ground. She heard a kid saying that he lost his wallet, and upon seeing Jolene with it, he assumed that she stole it. She attempted to explain the situation, but she was eventually taken in by the police. 
As her mother talked with the police, Jolene saw a man that was dressed like her father. As she left the prison station with her mom, a psychiatrist stated that daughters with bad relationships with their dads are more likely to engage in crime. In the present, Foo Fighters heals Jolene's wounds. However, a wound in the shape of her name won't heal. Jolene then realizes that her dad stayed distant to protect her and her mother. All he ever wanted was to protect his family. As they exit the execution chamber, Anisu asks Foo Fighters to trip Jolene so he can catch her. Though she's resistant, she does it anyway. Before he catches her, however, Jolene uses a string to grab onto a prisoner who has Dio's bone in his possession. The man slithers away as his spine bulges out from his back. As they close the distance, his body transforms into a plant. His head bursts open, with some sort of pollen coming out. The bloated inmates henceforth turn into plants. D and G stands over the bone. Though he wants to pick it up, he's afraid of touching it. Just then, flowers begin sprouting from Jolene's head. The three stare on in amazement as the inmates mutate into plants. Flowers start growing out of the side of Jolene's face. Anisu takes a look, but then they vanish. He deduces that the bone caused this transformation, and not an enemy stand. The bone is on a nearby root, but it rolls away when Jolene tries to get it. Her arms then sprout flowers. Anisu puts Diver down into her, expelling the plants from her system. Unfortunately, the plant has now become one with her. She urges him not to touch her, but he licks a flower on her face. He directs Jolene to the shade, lessening the bone's effectiveness. In search for the bone, Jolene locates a green baby with a star-shaped birthmark on it. She enters the sunlight to investigate the body, but Foo Fighters tries to pull her back. The plant grows at a rapid pace, yet she grabs the creature. The sun is setting in the west, the direction they need to escape in. Anisu comforts an inmate panicking in a cell. DNG observes all this from afar, but he's unsure as to what is happening. Guccio walks past him and clutches his shoulder. He asks where Jolene is, but Guccio's ribcage bursts out and pierces DNG in the arm. Anisu and the others escape while this takes place. DNG cries profusely after his arm was torn apart. Jolene and Anisu are with Yo Yo Ma at the dock. Anisu asks how to use the boat, as Yo Yo Ma explains how to do it. Anisu instructs him to release the mooring ropes. Anisu instructs Jolene to enter the boat, as Foo Fighter can handle herself. Foo Fighter then recalls how they escaped in a flashback. The three climbed out of the ventilation window at the east side of the prison. That side of the building was covered in shadow, halting the growth of the plants. They planned on waiting until night to allow the plant to wither away, but then Yo Yo Ma appeared and swallowed the baby whole. Stone Free punched him as Foo Fighter shot him in the face. Anisu used Driver down, but nothing expelled the baby. Yo Yo Ma then begged at Jolene's feet, offering various items to appease her. His user is D and G, so Foo Fighter shot him five times. Yet it still was ineffective. Jolene accidentally enters the sunlight, causing flowers to grow out of her face. Anisu tells Foo Fighter to kill the user as him and Jolene watch over the stand. As Anisu turns around, Foo Fighter's jaw is melted away by the spit of Yo Yo Ma. Jolene! Anisu! You can't get into a one on one with that thing! She then wonders if she should go after the boat, but she ultimately decides to chase after the user so she can kill him. Anisu stops the boat in a patch of grass. He explains he wants to keep quiet and yells at Yo-Yo Ma to do the same. The prison guard's boat races by them. Yo-Yo Ma impales his own eye on the lever of the boat, giving away their location. Anisu identifies a machine gun, warning Jolene. The guards, however, think the ripples are coming from a gator, meaning that they're still safe. Yo-Yo Ma suggests that they disguise themselves to blend in with the scenery. It works out for a bit, but the guards spot their anchoring rope in the water. The guards then get called back to the prison, as the motor of their boat blows away Jolene and Anisu's disguises. Anisu instructs Jolene to start it up, as the guards are thoroughly perplexed. They then aim the machine gun towards them, as Yo-Yo Ma spits mosquitoes at Jolene. The guards shoot the boat, as Anisu punches Yo-Yo Ma at the guards. How terrible! Treating me like an object! Not that I mind. Anisu commandeers the boat from the guards. The three ride the boat as Jolene gives Yo-Yo Ma a menacing glare. Anisu tells Jolene to stop whistling, but she doesn't know what he's talking about. She attempts to talk to him, but it turns out that her mouth is filled with holes. Thus, her voice is gone. She gestures to Anisu that they're under attack. Anisu, however, mistakes this for a gesture of love. He eventually gets the hint. Jolene determines that the stand acts as a slave, but looks for the opportune moment to attack. Do it! 
Just try and attack us. Yo-Yo Ma explains how to make a frog hide. Jolene then wonders what the stand's trigger is. She places her hands on Anisu's face and turns away from the stand as it makes its move. Thanks to her net barrier, she catches the stand's mosquitoes. Her face still becomes deformed as a result. She collapses to the ground, but then she writes, Be all eyes, with her strings. Should I still continue operating this boat, or would you rather I fight you one on one? Meanwhile, Foo Fighter crawls through the ventilation at the prison. The guards find D&G in an injured state. Foo Fighters lines up her shot, but hesitates when she sees Father Pucci observing the situation from behind a wall. Foo Fighters doesn't understand why he would be here given the situation. Diver Down attacks Yo-Yo Ma and kills the surrounding mosquitoes. No! He has more ways of attacking than that! You should be running! Sinks Jolene. Yo-Yo Ma's attacks are invisible. The sand suggests that he runs away, but Anisu isn't going anywhere. Anisu stomps on Yo-Yo Ma's head, instructing him to empty his pockets. The stand pulls out many items, as holes start developing on Anisu's face. The stand's target is Jolene, and he can't change that until he eliminates her. Anisu attacks with Diver Down, but it has no effect, as holes appear on his leg. Jolene determines that the stand is utilizing swamp water for its attack. Yo-Yo Ma starts acting like a frog, as Anisu tells Jolene that the attacks have stopped. Turns out that he implanted a frog's brain into Yo-Yo Ma's head. Though the stand wants to continue his objective, he can't control his new animal instincts. We need Foo Fighter to heal your wounds. All we have to do is wait for her to finish off D&G. Elsewhere, Foo Fighter wonders what she should do. Poochie counts prime numbers to calm himself. He determines that Jolene must still be alive. He desperately wants to get all the details about what happened from D&G. He tells Guccio that he's heading to heaven, as he uses his head to play some celebratory music. The guards will take away D&G for further questioning. Poochie wants to question him first, but Foo Fighters points her gun at him to prevent this from happening. Why is she here? When did she get here? Damn, she's gonna kill D&G! Foo Fighters fires several shots at D&G, but a guard with a disc in his head prevents any fatal blows from connecting. She then realizes that Father Pucci is none other than Whitesnake. Which is your top priority? My life? Or is it more urgent to take D&G's life? Foo Fighters thinks of how her memories with Jolene have given her a sense of purpose, a will to live. Foo Fighters chooses to shoot D&G, but Whitesnake manages to deflect the bullet and insert a disc in the back of her head. She then decides to shoot through her own head, yet it travels through and pierces D&G's jaw. I have to tell Jolene who Whitesnake really is! Foo Fighters needs water immediately to survive. Due to D&G dying, Yo-Yo Ma disintegrates to pieces. The green baby within its body starts falling into the water. Anasu reaches for it, but the green hand leaves an imprint on his. The plant mutation in the other prisoners is subsided, due to the child already being born. The green child manages to swim towards the land, and is now crawling away. Jolene needs to get to the child before Whitesnake does. She makes chase, but Anisu tells her that she is shrinking. She starts running again, with Anisu telling her to stop. Anisu comes in, but this time, he seems smaller. He eventually realizes that whenever they cut the distance in half to the baby, they shrink in half. Which means as they progressively get closer to the baby, they also get smaller as well which means that they'll never be able to approach the baby. Jolene refuses to accept this rationale. I'm going. There's no way it can't be caught. The guard dogs start picking up on their scent. Anisu states they need to hide from the dogs, but Jolene says, Anisu, I'll start thinking when I get to where I want to be. Anisu marvels at her concentration, propelling him to follow her. As the two approach the baby, it feels like it takes longer and longer to get closer. Jolene launches her string at the child, but she just can't seem to reach him. She wagers that she could jump down from a leaf to capture the child. Unfortunately, the string she releases feels like it's getting heavier due to a mysterious stand climbing on top of it. This appears to be the green baby's stand, and now it's eating Jolene's string. If Jolene can catch the stand, then the child will be caught as well. She attacks with Stone Free, but the stand crushes down on her leg. Diver Down comes in to rescue Jolene as they climb up a cliff to escape. The baby stand gets bigger as it approaches them. It then starts striking rocks at them, which get bigger as they get closer. The stand creates a rock slide that Jolene and Anisu have to run through. Anisu then explains that he rolled a bottle to the child, and because the child was curious and picked it up, it stayed the same size, allowing him to trap the three of them inside. 
The child is emanating pure evil, so it's paramount that they kill him now. Anasu phases Diver down into the walls of the bottle, moving the neck towards their location. The two escape, as they place the lid on the bottle to trap the stand inside. The stand starts rolling the bottle, trapping Anasu's legs underneath. Jolene wants to destroy the bottle to save him, but he urges her not to, as he doesn't want the stand to escape. Suddenly, the green baby climbs on top of Jolene as they return to normal size. Because the baby saw the star-shaped birthmark on her shoulder, he became fascinated by it. Jolene then thinks the baby is like her, but Anisu is convinced that this creature is their enemy. Meanwhile, FF needs to get to Jolene to tell her that Whitesnake is Father Pucci. Whitesnake bursts into the car. Take this, Foo Fighters! Whitesnake looks to take her disc, but her detached arm begins shooting at him. Did you see it? Back in the Punishment Ward, what was born? What was it like? Was it a plant? Was it beautiful? Foo Fighters warns him that the child may already be dead, but Whitesnake is certain that no one could possibly kill it. Just then, Foo Fighters' legs with her memory stand disc start running away. It replenishes itself with water to regenerate its body. Smug plankton scum like you don't have the right to give me lectures, screams Whitesnake. Foo Fighters finds out that the water coming from the faucet is boiling hot, scolding her entire body. With Foo Fighters gone, all Poochie has to do is find Jolene. Whitesnake looks to pick up the disc, but then he finds a radio on the ground that was on this entire time. The person on the other side of the radio is Weather Report, as he initiates a rainstorm. Bitch! She made Weather Report make it rain! I can't let you get away! Foo Fighters uses Morse code with Weather Report to make the fog thicker so she can escape. Whitesnake throws a disc through a bird's head. The bird saw her as he begins to attack. Despite this, it turns out it was his own reflection projected onto the mist. Foo Fighters then reaches Weather Report as Poochie counts prime numbers. Poochie blames people's failures on shame, but he still has the opportunity to possess the child if Jolene doesn't discover his identity. Jolene, thanks to Anasu, wonders why he's doing all this for her. You know how I feel about you, says Anasu. The green baby then starts biting his hair. The two decide to get down as a fog pervades the entire area. Foo Fighters and Weather Report approach them. It was Father Poochie! If Weather Report hadn't come, I would have been done for. Jolene is satisfied that Weather Report's wounds have all healed. Anasu then instructs FF to separate them through coarse language. He then wants to eliminate the green baby. He asks for Weather Report's support, but Weather Report responds by impaling Anasu with his hand. He then cuts Foo Fighter's face in half, revealing that he is, in fact, White Snake in disguise. After subduing them all, he says, This is it. It must be. I finally found it. The way to go to heaven. Dio, I will revive you and use your powers for my benefit. To tie up loose ends, Whitesnake looks to kill Jolene. However, she manages to place a string handcuff around his wrist. She pulls him in, looking to kick the backside of his neck, but he dodges. The two throw a flurry of punches at each other. Jolene then pierces his hands with the chains on the handcuff. While it looks like she has the dominant position, Pucci reveals that her stone free is turning into a disc. If he's able to grab it, it's all over. You totally lost me, and that's what I understand. In a flashback, Dio and Pucci are lounging together in the same bed. You know, bros just being bros. Two bros chilling in the hot tub, five feet apart cause they're not gay. Dio remarks that painters and sculptors are able to shape their souls into something that is almost like a stand. He then grabs onto Pucci's wrist. Are you gonna betray me someday? Why won't you attack me? If you take my stand, the world, you can become the ruler of this world. Poochie loves Dio as he loves God. He thusly refuses to take his disc. As a token of his apology, Dio hands him a piece of his bone. In the now, Poochie remarks that Jotaro has a short life. The two attack each other with Poochie using a small cross in his fingernail to move her disc so that it obstructs her vision. He looks to grab the disc, but Stone Free punches back. Poochie realizes that White Snake is outmatched. He then throws Jotaro's memory disc as a distraction. If the disc were to enter the body of a dying person, the disc, along with that person, would perish, dying along with its host. Jolene then sees Jotaro's memory disc in Anasu's body. Though this was a risky move on Poochie's part, he already memorized the details about how to attain heaven. Jolene, henceforth, must decide whether to save her father's disc or to finish off Poochie. She proceeds to pummel Poochie, but quickly withdraws to retrieve the disc. Poochie approaches the baby as Dio's bone ejects from his hand. The baby consumes the flesh of his arm. Now I can finally enter your world, Dio. 
Jotaro's disc enters Anasu's body before Jolene can pull it out. Anasu uses Diver Down to tell Foo Fighter to take over his body so that she can take out Jotaro's disc. Foo Fighter's spirit comes out of Anasu's body. Anasu, he got the disc back. Look at me, Jolene. This is my spirit. This is my intellect. I was alive. I'm glad I was able to say my goodbyes to you, Jolene. I'm glad you got your disc back. Poochie returns to prison, with his physical appearance looking different from before. Most notably, he's got a star on the backside of his neck. I have no further use for this prison. The child that was born is already in my possession. All I have to do is wait for heaven. A tiny handprint is seen on a teacup, along with Jotaro's disc. A flashback to Jotaro reading Dio's diary is then seen, where Dio talks about the path toward heaven. 36 human subjects who have sinned are needed. 14 phrases must be kept in mind, and what's most necessary is courage. The courage to destroy his stand momentarily to absorb the souls of the sinners. Whatever is born will awaken. Lastly, an appropriate location is needed. There, Pucci will wait for the new moon. That's when heaven will come. Emporio visits Jolene as the girl tells him that she plans on escaping from Green Dolphin Island. She reads her father's memory and finally understands what Pucci was after for these last 20 years. I'm Jolene Cujo. I have to seal whatever the priest just obtained. Although the prison holds a lot of stand users, not a single one has managed to escape. No one is able to pass through Hell's Gate, beyond the visiting rooms. Emporio, when is the next new moon? He can't help her, so he runs off. A mysterious woman conveys a message from White Snake. Don't even think about escaping. If she complies, her father's stand disc will safely get out of prison. The woman's name is Miu Miu, and her stand is Jailhouse Rock. Jolene says she's escaping now as she punches the woman in the face. But this was just an illusion. Jolene proceeds to wake up in bed, punching a poster on the wall. She then discovers her own handwriting on her body, which reads, Take the pen, quickly. Assume that you can only learn three new things at a time. And three, defeat the stand user. Her name is Miu Miu. Jolene questions a confused guess about what's going on, as she pulls out a piece of paper from Jolene's pocket. The doctor's note states that if she tries to learn a fourth piece of information, she forgets the first piece of information. It turns out she was placed back in this room two days ago. She then asks guess about Miu Miu. The latter states that she just walked by moments ago. Jolene exits her cell, staring down the mysterious Miu Miu. Jolene forgets her meal ticket and proceeds to eat Guess's lunch. Jolene needs to get Emporio, but worries about the current level of security in the prison. As Jolene eats, Miu Miu asks to sit down. Who was this again? Her... I know her. Miu Miu then puts a cockroach into Jolene's food. She then asks three questions, causing Jolene to forget what just happened. Miu Miu then wipes off the information on Jolene's arms. Anyone who plans on escaping and touches it can only remember three things. It's worse than losing all your memories. Jolene uses her strings to sew a message into her skin. Go meet Emporio. Emporio is then seen in the ghost room, suffering from the same stand attack as Jolene. He needs to get out of the room and talk to Jolene, but he keeps electrocuting himself due to his limited memory. Jolene watches a Johnny Depp movie in the lounging area. She leaves, reading a message on her left hand. Don't think, no matter who it is, anyone who stares at your left hand, punch them. Miu Miu runs away as Jolene gives chase. Unfortunately, she forgets what she's doing, getting shot by multiple guards. She turns her body into string to evade the guards. She's then reminded that she needs to meet Emporio. Meanwhile, Emporio tries to print a page of the head guard, Miu Miu, who's in charge of the visiting room and the front gate. Jolene enters the room that leads to Emporio, which is exactly what Miu Miu was waiting for. Jolene gets electrocuted when she enters the ghost room. Upon looking at the boy's arm, she discovers that he can only remember three things too. Emporio says they need a printout of the head guard. Miu Miu then enters the room. I hereby deem you a prison breaker. Stone free to flex the bullets, but the first of the four shots went into Emporio. Bitch! I'll never forgive you! Miu Miu fires a barrage of bullets, but Jolene uses a reflection in the water to perceive all of them as one memory. She then holds up her arm. Get revenge for Emporio. Emporio wakes up, not understanding why he's hurt. He just knows that he has to make a printout. Elsewhere, Jolene wraps up her string around Miu Miu's face. 
Three guards are called back by Miu Miu, causing Jolene to forget what she was doing. Miu Miu intentionally deceives Jolene as the ladder falls down the stairs. There's no one who can escape from my jailhouse rock. Emporio comes out of the wall, handing Jolene a printout of binary code. She uses the code to recreate an image of Miu Miu's face with her string. That means you're an enemy, right? Stonefree proceeds to pummel Miu Miu to defeat her. At a store, a woman attempts to steal several packages of underwear. The woman nearly drops all of her items upon leaving, but Father Pucci manages to catch everything. Pucci leaves the area, looking to be out of sorts. He feels physically drained, and White Snake is no longer his stand ability. The special place he's heading towards is Cape Canaveral, and the new moon will be here in six days. The woman's baby then looks like a half-grown adult. At prison, Jolene holds Miu Miu hostage. She moves away, but after saying three things, the guards forget what they were doing. Turns out that Jolene forced Miu Miu to use Jailhouse Rock on all the guards. They walk past Hermie's cell, explaining that they're escaping. Pucci continues roaming the town, noticing many coincidences involving the number three. Just then, a coin, a bullet, and a skull ring all roll towards him. One of the patients wakes up and holds Father Pucci hostage with a pair of scissors. I just saw a shooting star in the night sky. Three of them, actually. Do you know who you really are? The junkie lodges the scissors into Pucci's throat. I believe this now. You cannot kill me. The police fire several shots at the junkie. Mysteriously, the junkie now has the Joestar birthmark on his shoulder, as a stick figure from a traffic sign pulls him to safety. At prison, Weather tells Anisu that Jolene escaped. Anisu then discovers the Joestar birthmark on Weather's neck. I'm going after the priest. I'm going to escape. In a public washroom, Anisu tells Weather not to do anything that will draw attention to themselves. Anisu wonders who he truly is, given that he has the Joestar family birthmark on his shoulder. Weather then causes a rain of sunshine on an old man, alleviating the pain in his knee. The old man then offers them a ride in his pickup truck. Weather senses that Jolene is heading north, so that's where they're gonna go too. They look at a guidebook for Disney World, noticing blank silhouettes all over the magazine. This frustrates Anasu, since there's no Mickey Mouse anywhere. Just then, Anasu notices a potential enemy behind them. He summons Diver down, only to find a wooden doll that looks like Pinocchio. The two determine that Pucci is sending stand users to prevent them from meeting up with Jolene. Who the hell are you? You should not hit me. Children all over the world will be sad. The doll tells a lie, causing the nose to pierce Anasu's face. Anasu grabs an apple off the ground as the seven dwarves tell him it's poisoned. Snow White pops out from one of the crates. Anasu determines that the characters are coming out from the books. A news report states that Mickey Mouse has disappeared. Weather starts eating the apple and reads the magazine. He then calls out for Anasu, telling the driver to stop the truck. Anasu sees himself crushed underneath the truck. You've been separated. But anyway, who did you like the most? It was me, right? I thought so. Diver Down attempts to save his double, but he gets stuck. He tells the old man to stop the truck, but he, mysteriously, has a double too. The truck crashes, with Weather making airbags out of clouds. Anasu questions Pinocchio about what's going on. The doll says his soul is separated from his body because he wished it to happen. Anasu proceeds to crush the doll. After finishing off the doll, Anasu returns to his normal body. Weather doesn't know anything about Pinocchio or the dwarves, but suggests that they need to defeat the stand user to halt the attacks. Suddenly, the old man transforms into the big bad wolf. Unable to summon his stand, Anasu deduces that he's separated from his body again. Hey look, Weather! Can't you hear me? That's me! I'm over there! A boy attempts to shake hands with Spider-Man, only to be knocked over by a running Anasu. A candy shop owner looks to call the police, because of the mess that he created. Anasu reimburses the man, and asks which way his quote-unquote twin brother went. Anasu sees his body escaping as two police officers confront him. He embeds chocolates into his skin to distort the appearance of his face. As he runs after his double, he walks by a television set. And a news report states that Kenshiro and Reio from Fists of the North Star have had a fight in Tokyo. Anasu ends up in an alley, hearing a strange voice from a grandfather clock. A lamb emerges from the broken clock, blaming him for killing his brothers. The lamb tells a story in which an angry mother goat cuts out the innards of a wolf. She then fills it up with rocks and dumps him into the river. 
Just then, Anisu's body begins transforming into the wolf from the story. Weather then walks past the portrait of Van Gogh. Works of art come to life all over the world, as Weather looks for the stand user. The lamb continues reading the book, as Anisu tells him to stop. The mother lamb then attacks him with a pair of scissors. Anisu crushes her on the ground, but then she unfolds as a piece of origami. He then closes a door, as Diver Down manipulates it so it won't open anymore. Nevertheless, the door opens up like pages in a story. Van Gogh asks Weather a question, but the latter angrily tells him not to come near. The portrait claims that Weather is now living the life of Van Gogh. Weather's ear falls off, just like the real Van Gogh, and he accidentally shoots himself with a gun. That's because the real Van Gogh shot himself in real life. In a panic, Weather blocks off the highway heading north. Elsewhere, the mother goat gashes into Anasu's abdomen, releasing another lamb. Angaro is now in a plane heading towards Key West, and he is the stand user for Bohemian Rhapsody, which is responsible for bringing all the fictional characters to life. Peter Pan flies by the plane. It's so fucking satisfying to see a world that treated me like shit fall into chaos and despair. Weather determines that the stand user is on a plane, and his ability can no longer reach him at this point. He runs away from the portrait of Van Gogh, only to have Anisu crash into him with a stomach filled of rocks. The pistol fires a second time, blowing off Weather's head. Despite this, Weather grabs onto the portrait, forcing him to create a fictional character called Putback. With this new hero, all his stories will come alive, and the story will end with him bringing everything back to reality. Everything, henceforth, returns back to normal. Realizing that he would be reverting back to his hopeless life, Angaro, out of boredom, enters a coma. Eight hours before Anasu and Weather report escape prison, Jolene paid Romeo a little visit. The desperate man begged for forgiveness, but Jolene harbored no resentment. She just came to collect money and a car. As Jolene leaves the premises, Romeo calls the police to report her. Yet, Jolene knows this since she placed one of Hermes stickers onto his tongue. To their surprise, however, Romeo gives the police false information, leading them on a wild goose chase. Romeo, you... you surprise me. You're a better person than I thought. But I think I'll take off this sticker anyway, just in case. Jolene says they'll take the helicopter to get where they need to go. Elsewhere, Pucci meets up with the Sons of Dio, except for Giorno for some reason, so that they can protect him and take him to Cape Canaveral. The three sons are Angaro, Raikil, and Versace. Raikil bemoans his unfortunate circumstances, but Pucci reminds him to remember his bloodline. Support me. Live to serve me. Pucci tells him that he can control organisms known as skyfish. Pucci tells a story of skydivers recording objects that appear to be rods. Raikil realizes that he can control these things as he becomes more confident in himself. Mysteriously, one of Pucci's teeth then fall out. Inside the helicopter, Hermes notices that one of the windows is open. Just then, all of their eyelids are forcibly shut, as blood rolls down Jolene's face. Hermes determines that something is inside the helicopter, as Jolene tries to capture it with Stone Free. In a last-ditch effort, Jolene has all of them jump out of the helicopter to escape the threat. Hermes notices a skyfish, so she uses Kiss to crush it. Hermes! This is the limit! We're gonna hit the ground! The three crash into the water as they investigate the skyfish. Raikil then confronts the three, admitting he was the one who attacked the helicopter. Jolene and Hermes tell Emporio to back off as they prepare for battle. The two girls look for some rocks to throw as Raikil's bike sinks into the mud. Hermes throws some rocks at Miss, but she then pulls off the stickers so that they return to hit the backside of Raikil's head. The two girls then notice the rods suspended in midair. Raikil regains his composure and stops Hermes from throwing the rocks by manipulating her fingers. Raikil then talks about the Apollo 11 space mission as Emporio starts to urinate blood. What the fuck? screams Hermes as her finger falls off. Jolene lashes out with Stone Free, but twists her ankle in the process. Emporio determines that he's controlling their muscles somehow. He then notices that there's a strange mark on his skin where he was storing Jodoro's stand disc. He deduces that the temperature of his kidney is much lower than the other organs in his body, which means that he's now susceptible to disease. From this, he determines that the rods survive by eating body heat. The two girls experience a sudden swelling in their tissues. Jolene, the water! Go underwater! Says Emporio. Raikil targets the brainstem of Jolene, which would be fatal if it experienced a temperature loss. Jolene whips out her lighter, setting her entire body ablaze. The, 
This bitch! My spirit is stronger than hers. Jolene smacks down Raikil, noticing the star-shaped birthmark on his shoulder. Finish him off, Jolene. Raikil douses himself in gasoline, attempting to determine her weaknesses by feeling her pain. Jolene goes in for the finishing blow, but his body crumbles into smaller pieces. Raikil targeted Jolene's hypothalamus, which is connected to the nerves in the eyes, thus creating floaters in her vision. Essentially, she's now seeing after images from seconds ago. I'm Apollo 11, screams Raikil. To prevent further attacks, Jolene stops breathing and kicks him with devastating consequences. Stonefree pummels Raikil. However, the son of Dio numbed the nerves in his body so that he doesn't feel pain. He will thusly fight to the bitter end. After their violent collision, the two are completely drained of energy. Jolene musters enough strength to knock him over, revealing that his hand blocked his own attack. Raikil admits that he can no longer control the rods. He explains that everything is guiding Poochie to his ultimate destiny of attaining heaven, and even Jolene is playing a part in that. When Father Pucci got the star-shaped mark, Weather Report must have gotten the same thing as well, because he's the priest's younger brother. Hermes puts in the finishing blow, saying it's all bullshit. Jolene, Hermes, and Emporio now make their way to Orlando. The three arrive at the hospital that Pucci is purportedly in. At the same time, Weather Report and Anasu arrive at the same hospital. Weather senses that Jolene, the priest, and someone else is in the area. Inside, Pucci has Versace try a seafood dish to make sure there's no shellfish inside, since he's allergic. Versace verifies that the scalp sauce has shellfish. Jolene and Hermes enter the hospital, looking for Pucci. Suddenly, a crying child's head comes out of the plate of food, screaming that he was shot by his father. A bullet fires off from his neck, hitting a bystander in the hallway. Jolene and Hermes investigate the room that the bullet came from, but no one is inside. Jolene enters the room anyway, discovering a giant hole in the floor. Jolene sees that someone was tunneling in the hole. Despite being an obvious trap, Jolene needs to stop Pucci here and now, before he attains heaven. She gives Hermes some of her string so that she can signal her when she's in trouble. Jolene picks up a spoon and is transported inside of a plane. A newspaper reads July 21st, 2005. She looks out the window, catching a glimpse of Pucci, Versace, and the Underworld, which is Versace's stand. Jolene attempts to communicate with Hermes, but she appears to be trapped. Underworld lurks outside the airplane, scaring Jolene. Hermes starts pulling on the string as Jolene goes through the fuselage and comes into contact with Underworld. She attacks with Stone Free, but Underworld concentrates its efforts on cutting the string. Jolene manages to lodge a pen in his neck. Pucci tells Versace that Jolene has a wealth of experience, and all they need to do is hide in this hole for three days. As Hermie pulls on the string, Sports Max comes out of the hole. Max explains that Underworld Stan takes some memories from the Earth and excavates them. Essentially, it can materialize old memories stored within the Earth. Hermes falls into the hole, getting trapped within the plane that is scheduled to crash on July 21st, 2005. The flight attendant states that the plane will be crashing in three minutes. The passengers' bodies start to burn up, since that's what's happened after the plane exploded. Jolene looks outside again, seeing Pucci, Versace, and the Underworld. Pucci senses that weather is outside as Versace gets flustered by the situation. Jolene hands Hermes her string, opens the hatch, and leaps outside. Stonefree then attempts to punch Versace, but then the glass from a fighter plane gets in the way. Jolene's string snaps off, but she manages to grab a police radio out of desperation. Pucci determines she'll use that radio to contact her allies, much to the exasperation of Versace. Versace didn't like his stepfather, so he ran away at the age of 13. As he looked for a place to spend the night, a pair of baseball shoes fell from the sky. The shoes were worth $10,000, and a judge assumed that he stole them, sending him to six months in juvenile detention. Versace would suffer from bullying and a hand wound that nearly killed him. Despite the fact that Pucci helped him out, Versace contemplates stuffing him inside the plane as well. He then creates a memory of Pucci in the earth and steals Weather's memory disc. Maybe I can use this. I want the ability to go to heaven. Jolene calls Emporio, telling him to find a way to get them out. Just then, the fighter plane crashes into the commercial airliner. Emporio tells him that there were two survivors on the flight, and they should head to those seats right now. Underworld attempts to destroy those seats before they can reach them. The two arrive at the seats. Move it! We're taking those seats! Upon clearing the space, Versace pushes three sick children into the hole and onto the seats, forcing Jolene to save herself or the children. Unable to make a choice, the plane crashes into the ground. The old man who originally survived the plane crash was duplicated by one of Hermes' stickers, and she henceforth placed one of the children inside of him to spare him. W where's Hermes? Then where did Jolene Cujo go? 
Hermes latched herself in between a woman for safety. A string comes out of Hermes' mouth, meaning that Jolene hid within Hermes' body for protection. Stonefree proceeds to pummel Versace and hang him upside down from a rock. Pucci is in no hurry to lend him a hand, as Stone Free looks for the finishing blow. Underworld escapes with Weather's memory disc, as Father Pucci is livid. When Weather gets his memory back, he won't be Pucci's ally, and Versace knows this because he read the memory disc. Versace! You're nothing more than a shack made of straw! Don't think that you can invade upon the fortress that Dio and I have created. Numerous rainbows manifest inside the cave, as Weather has finally received his memories back. Don't touch me, asshole. Don't make me kill you. Weather's demeanor has completely changed into an aggressive asshole. Anasu wonders what has sparked this sudden change. Hermes looks to finish off Versace, but upon touching one of the rainbows, her arm burst open with tiny slimy balls. Versace states that Weather can manipulate the ozone layer and destroy all of life. Pucci warns everyone that either they need to kill Weather or seal his memory again. Otherwise, they'll all die before the new moon. Versace runs away and deactivates Underworld in the process. A policeman looks to arrest Jolene and Hermes, but then his head burst open with multiple snails coming out. We then get a quick synopsis of the ozone layer's importance. It ends with a hypothetical question. Wondering what would happen if the ozone layer suddenly disappeared. Versace digs up the memories of Jolene and Hermes, determining that they came into contact with a person named Emporio. Therefore, Versace concentrates his efforts on finding him so that he can acquire Jotaro's stand disc. Inside the hospital, two policemen explode in the snails, as the entire hospital is now covered in them. Jolene notices that Hermes' body is transforming into a snail, and since she touched her, her arm goes through a similar transformation. Elsewhere, Weather has two women give him a massage, as he electrocutes them. On June 5th of 1916, in 1972, a newborn baby died in her mother's arms. Unable to accept this, she swapped her dead baby with a pair of twins before anyone noticed. Years later, a young Poochie tripped inside of a church. He then noticed an intruder, who turned out to be Dio. Dio explained that he can't go outside since he's allergic to the sun. He then wonders if Pucci twisted his ankle. Pucci explains that he was born with twisted toes. Dio henceforth hands him a stone arrow and heals his twisted toes. It turns out that Pucci was born to a wealthy family, and he lived a happy life with his younger sister, Perla. He later found out that his twin brother, Domenico, died shortly after being born. While cleaning the church one day, a woman confessed to switching her dead baby with someone else's child. Do you know who his real parents are? A couple named Pucci. They live in a large mansion in the town next to mine. In a cafe, Perla's handbag was stolen. The delivery boy threw cans at the thief, knocking him out. From there on, West Blue Marine, known by his friends as Weather, started a relationship with Perla. Despite having a personal connection to the woman's story, Pucci had to maintain the privacy of her confession. Upon finding out that Perla was dating their brother, Enrico paid a private detective to make them break up. Unbeknownst to Enrico, the detective was part of a white supremacist group, and upon finding out that Weather's parents were an interracial couple, he proceeded to beat him up in front of Perla. The detective reveals that this is what Enrico wanted, and that they've already set Weather's house ablaze and killed his mother. Weather was henceforth hung from a tree overlooking a cliff. Heartbroken by the situation, Perla took her own life by leaping off of the cliff. Unfortunately for her, Weather was still alive. Pucci arrives on the scene, questioning why the woman took his younger brother instead of him. Pucci clutches onto his dead sister's body. I should be the one who's damned! He then hears Dio's voice in his head. If you wish, you can come see me. Perla's disc pops out of her head as the arrow pierces through Enrico's neck. You'll be able to preserve her memory, her heart and soul. That is your ability. We then see the same marking on Weather's neck. Later on, Weather enacted revenge on the private detective, but when he attempted to kill himself, his stand prevented it from happening. He proceeded to try to kill himself numerous times, but fate would not allow him to die. An outbreak of snails then plagued the city. Enrico then confronted Weather, admitting to being his older brother. In their exchange, Enrico managed to seal his memory, and shortly afterwards, departed to meet up with Dio. In the now, Jolene wonders what Weather could be doing to cause all of this. She continues believing that Weather is their ally, as she makes it her mission to kill Versace first. Jolene swings across the ceilings with her string, as a wall of snails falls towards her. 
The ceiling starts to collapse with snails, with Jolene swinging over to Hermes. Jolene then throws Hermes into a glass door. Just before it breaks, however, Hermes uses a sticker to duplicate it, allowing them to slide out of the hospital unharmed. It is now time for the both of them to find and kill Versace. The snail outbreak infests the streets of Orlando. Versace looks for Emporio, thinking he's got a laptop, but since he doesn't know what he looks like, he walks right past him. He then digs up the memory of Jolene calling Emporio, which allows him to locate the boy. He then attempts to take Jotaro's disc. Inside a car, Jolene's foot transforms into a snail foot, causing her to crash the car near Versace and Emporio. Hermes determines that an empty snail shell means that there's a predator nearby. Versace drags Emporio behind a bush, but Jolene catches a glimpse of them. She rushes out of the car, but her new transformation inhibits her movement. Numerous snail predators including beetles, surround Hermes. Jolene is reduced to crawling towards the bushes. Oddly enough, the Miami Dolphins come out of the bushes and drag Jolene away in the midst of performing a play. Versace wonders how Emporio made Jotaro's disc disappear as Jolene escapes from the Miami Dolphins. She then bursts out of a pipe and uses said pipe to whack Versace. She attacks with Stone Free, but Versace summons a memory of salt to throw at her. Due to being a snail, she is vulnerable to dehydration. Jolene is subdued, Hermes is being consumed by beetles, and Versace finds the location of the disc. Versace then runs off in victory. Unfortunately for him, his body begins to transform into a snail. The outbreak continues to spread, as Anasu demands to know what happened. Weather then asks Anasu to kill him. He says he'll settle the score with Enrico, sensing that his brother is nearby. Despite scanning the area with their stands, Enrico is nowhere to be seen. They then approach an empty car. Suddenly, Weather's right leg is lopped off by Poochie as the priest emerges from a mass of snails. It even seems like he's immune to the snails. Anasu lunges in for an attack, but several snails infect him in the process. Jolene grabs onto Versace, but everyone is transforming into snails, making their situation insurmountable. Pucci seems to have defeated the two, but Weather attacks him with his right leg, replaced by Driver Down. The two engage each other with Weather knocking Pucci into a car with a gust of wind. Weather continues attacking, but Pucci reflects the sun rays with a mirror. Anasu's transformation accelerates rapidly, causing Diver Down to become disabled, crippling weather. Pucci explains that heavy weather modifies the atmosphere into influencing humans, so that they believe that they're transforming into snails. Essentially, the human mind makes the transformation occur. Weather, nevertheless, is founded on sunlight, so Pucci blinded himself to prevent this transformation, relying solely on his mystic sense to detect his brother. Pucci continues speaking about the power of subliminal messaging. He then declares his victory over Anasu and Weather. Pucci proceeds to cut off Weather's other leg as Anasu lashes out. Pucci responds by punching him with White Snake. The priest then impales his own foot on an ice spike. He now finds himself unable to move due to the risk of killing himself. Weather freezes his blood and sets up a maze of spikes to trap Pucci. Weather crawls towards him, but Pucci, using White Snake, is able to brainwash him revealing the positions of the spikes and how to escape. However, a spike impales the priest in the jaw. Pucci falls towards the blood spikes on the ground. Weather uses air pressure to make Pucci lose his balance, but Pucci throws several spikes at him in hopes that he'll divert his air pressure. Weather intends to die anyway, allowing the spikes to impale him. I finally got you. Weather extends the spears with more of his blood and proceeds to punch Pucci with his stand. Pucci begs for his life, but Weather declares that he is evil as he goes in for the finishing blow. This is the end, Enrico Pucci. Abruptly, a car crashes next to them with Versace, Hermes, Jolene, and Imperio. Jolene senses Pucci nearby, but Enrico already punched through Weather's chest with the aid of fate. As the dust settles, Jolene calls out for Weather. Hermes then identifies Enrico trying to escape. Everyone's bodies return to their normal form. All of a sudden, Jolene sees Pucci. She propels herself forward. Unfortunately, she sees Weather impaled on White Snake's arm. Flabbergasted, Jolene doesn't see White Snake's attack, but Diver Down disrupts Pucci to save Jolene. Anasu reveals that Pucci created an illusion using Versace, who died during the commotion, allowing the priest to escape in the meantime. They then find the corpse of Weather. Disturbed by the incident, Jolene blames herself for his death. 
Anasu states that Weather died on his own terms, and that he left his disc behind for their use. The four drive to Cape Canaveral to stop Poochie's plan. Jolene then thinks about Weather's death and her father Jotaro. Unsure what to do at this point, she falls asleep on Anasu's chest. Anasu then slips a ring on her finger, promising he'll confess his feelings when she wakes up. Hermes then yells at an alligator is on the side of the road, waking up Jolene. Holy crap! That's one huge alligator! Take this bastard! Anasu desperately demands for Jolene to open up her hands, wondering what she just threw at the alligator. Meanwhile, Poochie waits at the Kennedy Space Center. He's allowed to enter early since the tourists pretended that they were in the same party. A pre-launch recording explains that the trickiest part of launching into space is escaping Earth's gravity. Cape Canaveral has a gravitational pull that is fairly weak, making it optimal for space launches. Just then, the tourist is pulled into a barrier that kills him. Emporio pulls out his ghost computer and displays a map of the site. While they formulate a plan, Jolene notices the animals are running wildly alongside the road. The car stops working as the group soon realizes that the Earth's gravity is now directed sideways. The car falls towards the horizon. Jolene, Emporio, and Anasu manage to hang onto a railing as Hermes remains trapped in the car and disappears into the horizon. Pucci is now walking on the walls as he speaks about the importance of gravity for the Earth and humans. Just then, a new stand begins to emerge. Jolene throws a string to the falling Hermes, but she can't reach it. The gravity intensifies, uprooting trees in the process. Worried about the cryptic force, the group makes their way to the Kennedy Space Center. Anasu notices that Jolene regained her confidence. The group eventually reaches the courtyard of the Space Center. The new stand, unaffected by the gravity, approaches Jolene from behind, but she defends with stone free. She takes note that the stand is unlike anything she has ever seen before. Her hand then slides into a booth that she was standing on, turning it inside out. A fist fight then ensues between Jolene and Sea Moon. As it turns out, anything Sea Moon touches is turned inside out. Emporio, via observing the fight, determines that Sea Moon is reversing the gravity of objects it touches. Sea Moon disappears for a moment, attacking from inside the booth that Jolene is on. Jolene manages to evade the attack and kicks him in the jaw. Sea Moon punches her in the leg, which causes it to twist itself. Sea Moon attacks again, but Jolene blocks with her hand and leg, reversing the effect of the gravity on her limbs. Despite sustaining damage, Jolene has inflicted a fair amount of damage on Sea Moon. Anasu wants Emporio to climb over the railings and get out of the way so he can help Jolene. Sea Moon throws the first punch, but Jolene does well to dodge it. She dodges more attacks, but gets caught in the booth due to Sea Moon's ability. Jolene! says Anasu. This ticket booth has already been turned inside out. Jolene is surprised by the stand's accurate attacks, making her believe that the stand is a remote control stand, meaning Poochie must be close by, somewhere where he can see Jolene. Diver Down intervenes, but several tiles Sea Moon touched smack Anasu in the face. Jolene sends a string to Anasu and ties the end of it around Sea Moon's neck. Anasu warns her that Sea Moon will turn the string inside out, and it will mean that her whole arm will be broken into pieces. Sea Moon touches a string, which begins to turn itself inside out. Outside the Space Center, the army is blocked off by the power of Sea Moon, causing the trucks and the soldiers to slip away. The gravity even causes the helicopters to crash. Jolene's string that she's using to choke Sea Moon begins to disintegrate. She closes the distance to deliver the finishing blow, but Sea Moon twists the metal beam to evade her attack. The stand then manages to get a full grip on the string. Nevertheless, Diver Down transfers the damage to himself. Allowing Jolene to get close to Sea Moon, Poochie then makes his appearance known, as Jolene wastes no time in attacking him. Stone Free proceeds to attack the priest, yet he doesn't budge. Jolene then floats away from Poochie. Enrico is now the center of the new gravity, and since she jumped towards him, she fell away from him. Poochie commands Sea Moon to hit her vital spots, as Jolene floats in a helpless position. The stamp proceeds to punch her in the gut. Pucci heads back inside the space center as Jolene's string disintegrates. Her body starts to turn inside out as it looks to be all over. Heartbroken by Jolene's apparent death, Anasu and Emporio do nothing to stop Hoochie. The priest then turns his head back, looking at the horizon. Emporio then receives a message from Jotaro Kujo. The father senses that his daughter is in danger, but she is not dead. Emporio instructs Anasu to find her, as Pucci also senses that Jolene is still alive. Anasu decides that to protect Jolene, he needs to eliminate the priest. We can assume that they fuse to become one stand. A person can only have one stand. The green child and white snake have already disappeared. 
Poochie thought his last hit on Jolene turned her hearts inside out. He then watches over the space center and the few remaining civilians. Poochie then finds a torn piece of Jolene's clothing. Anisu crawls his way toward Poochie as C. Moon goes to punch him. This turned out to be a civilian that Anisu disguised as himself. C. Moon's punch causes several bone shards to spring towards him. While he diverts the shards, Anasu attacks Pucci from the rear. Pucci collapses his face to avoid the punch. He then changes his position to allow Anasu to fall away from him. Simun closes the distance to provide the finishing blow, but all of a sudden, Jolene's hand attempts to grab his face. Unfortunately for the priest, he can't locate Jolene, but she is lurking around him. Pucci finds himself in a cafe. He feels the urgency to kill her before Joro and Anasu come to help. Poochie then thinks she's hiding in some debris, so he pours on some oil and lights it ablaze. Jolene then grabs Poochie from an air vent. She disappears and reappears, this time choking him from behind. Jolene finally appears, her stomach replaced by a mass of Mobius strings. Simu manages to hit Stonefree's neck, but Jolene's neck simply forms into a Mobius strip. Due to the Mobius strip being an object with a single surface, it cannot, therefore, be turned inside out. This is what a German mathematician discovered in the 19th century. The shape with no inside or outside, the Mobius strip. Can you withstand this blow if I target your brain? Seamoon and Stonefree go at each other as Jolene transforms anything Seamoon touches into Mobius Strip. A dead security guard falls near Pucci. The priest uses his gun to shoot at Jolene. Just then, time stops and Jolene disappears. Star Platinum punches Pucci, sending him into a doorframe. Hermes and Jodoro then make their appearance. Turns out, the Speedwagon Foundation used a propeller spear as an anchor, with Hermes using Kiss to duplicate it, and have it go to the original to bypass the gravity. Pucci makes a realization that he doesn't have to abide by the specified location or time. Since he can manipulate gravity, he will simulate the appropriate conditions to evolve further. He then floats into the air, gravitating closer to his goal. He then searches for the exact gravitational effect that will achieve heaven. Jodoro then congratulates his daughter. He tells Hermes to fire the gun at the priest. Unfortunately, C. Moon deflects the oncoming bullets. Jodoro stops time again, this time throwing the spear at Pucci. Despite this, Pucci turns his eyes within the time stop. This allows him to move his head in a way to avoid the spear's fatal impact, although it does still take off his ear. The momentum carries Pucci to the shuttle on display. Pucci's body then begins to break down into light. He makes one last prayer before the light engulfs him. Diver Down throws a punch at Pucci, but then his arm disintegrates, and from the light comes a brand new stand. It's no longer Sea Moon. The time for heaven has finally arrived. Pucci continues his transformation as a new stand, a mix between a donkey and a humanoid rider, makes its appearance. Anasu looks to attack, but a blinding light pervades the whole space center. Jolene wakes up afterwards, as her and the others are unharmed. The gravity has returned to normal, and everyone has moved 200 meters, with Pucci completely disappearing. Hermes says Pucci is hiding as she enters the building due to the oncoming rain. Weirdly enough, everyone finds themselves soaked, and the rain has ceased. The automatic door in the building closes at an incredible speed. Jotaro now notices that he's dried off. Anasu tries to stop a rock from falling on Hermes, but it's already fallen. Jolene notices that the sun is already setting, realizing that everything is moving more rapidly than usual. Around the world, strange events are happening to people. Ice cream melts at a rapid pace, music plays at high speeds, and a girl sneezes, and before she has a chance to wipe it off, the mucus has already dried. An employee enters a giant freezer, but ends up freezing not long afterwards. And even helicopters trying to land go too fast and crash into the ground. Jolene, Jodoro, Hermes, and Emporio notice that the time has accelerated, leaving humans lagging behind at normal speed. Nighttime arrives as Jodoro notices a shadow stalking the group. He stops time with Star Platinum, catching a brief glimpse of the new stand and Pucci. Time resumes again. Jodoro realizes that his power has also accelerated, leaving him with less time than usual. Anasu pulls Jodoro up to a roof, and using this moment to its fullest, he asks him, I'm determined to protect your daughter with my life, so please, give me your permission to marry your daughter. What? What the fuck? Caught off guard, Jodoro asks Anasu to repeat himself. Anasu says that Jolene is the light of his life. Jolene interrupts, saying they should stay close together to protect themselves. Anasu continues asking Jotaro to marry his daughter, but Jotaro pulls his daughter close to himself, explaining that although the priest can move freely in this accelerated time, they can still see him. Essentially, he's moving at a speed of a bullet train, so they need to try and sense that movement. 
Jotaro sees a glimpse of the enemy stand, so he uses Star Platinum, the world. He looks around, eventually seeing Pucci spring-loaded on a tree, prepared to launch himself. Time resumes to its normal flow, as Pucci instantaneously appears behind Jotaro. Star Platinum attempts to punch Pucci, but he misses. And before anyone else notices, the priest has already sliced through Jotaro's neck. Jotaro then falls down as everyone panics. Pucci prepares to attack from behind Jolene, but before this happens, time stops again. Jotaro has a minor wound, since Diver Down took the brunt of the attack. The weakened Jotaro crawls towards Pucci, but can't reach him during the time stop. Time resumes its normal flow, allowing Pucci to avoid Star Platinum's attack. Pucci states that his power will guide him towards happiness, announcing that his stand is called Made in Heaven. He then states that everyone on this roof will die. Emporio shoots the priest with a gun, but Pucci easily dodges. Nevertheless, he wasn't aiming for Pucci. This was part of Emporio's trick, because he used one of Hermes' stickers on the bullet. Emporio pulls off the sticker, allowing everyone to fly off at a high speed. Nevertheless, Pucci simply runs towards them at a high speed. Anisu then has a spark of inspiration, asking Emporio to direct him to the ocean. Pucci runs ahead of the Joestar group. Anisu instructs Emporio to shoot toward the ocean this time. Pucci poises himself for another attack, so Anisu wants to use himself as bait to allow Jotaro to use his time stop and kill him. Because Diver Down is phasing into Jotaro's body, he'll receive a signal when Pucci strikes him. Though this is a suicidal mission on Anisu's part, he thinks he can give the signal to Jotaro before the blow reaches his vitals. All right, ask me. Your plan, it still has hope. Even if there's only one path that we can take, if there's only a hint of hope, then that's the right path. The group then lands in the water as intended. Because time keeps accelerating, the waves from the ocean hide the priest. Anasu is then impaled, as per his plan. Now, time stop. I've got him. Take this, Father Pucci. He used Jolene's stand to... The effects of Made in Heaven are affecting the whole world. A dead man's corpse rots away immediately. A mangaka panics as he only drew one page in a night, and wonders how Rohan Kishibi can still make the deadline. A broadcast proves that time is accelerated, but a physicist claims there's no mathematical evidence to prove this. Meanwhile, Jotaro has four seconds left to finish off Pucci. As he makes his way towards the priest, he notices a bunch of knives hovering over Jolene. Nani? He moves his daughter out of the way and goes to punch Pucci, but he's two steps too late. Jotaro Kujo, your daughter is your weakness, says Pucci. Maiden Heaven slices off Hermes' arms and cuts through Jotaro's head, killing them both in the process. Jolene thinks about her father as one of the knives pierces her abdomen. Pucci eliminated them, just like he eliminated Emporio's mother in the past. Shoot me, then you can leave the world as a martyr. Emporio fires off multiple rounds, but Pucci dodges them all. The boy sinks into the water as Stone Free throws a barrage of punches. He avoids them all, but a knife impales his right eye. He dives underwater to look for her as she and Emporio ride away on some dolphins. Despite Pucci's speed, he still has to account for the distance that he travels, which makes a big difference when he's holding his breath underwater. If he's not careful, he'll drown. Jolene wants Emporio to go alone, since Pucci will relentlessly pursue her until she's dead. We then see the corpses of Jotaro, Hermes, and Anasu decaying in the water. Emporio is the only hope, as Jolene plans on stalling the priest. Stone Free lunges in, but has her arms sliced off by the priest. Emporio watches in horror, as a collection of butterflies fly above the water. Time then accelerates faster, making the sun look like a flaming belt of light. Everything disintegrates in the blink of an eye. The whole geography of the Earth begins to change. Not long afterwards, Emporio is stuck in a void with animals and plants. He can't even breathe. A bright light shines on him as he wakes up behind a trash can. He's back in prison again, somehow, except everyone is naked. He puts his clothes on and hears Jolene's voice having a familiar conversation with her father. He looks inside, seeing a slightly different Jolene and Jodro. Father Pucci arrives, stating the universe has gone through a full cycle. This is a new world in which humanity has reached a common end. A new dawn. Pucci claims their souls no longer exist. The dead cannot return. All the obstacles are gone, except for Emporio. So Pucci will eliminate him here and now. Emporio attempts to hide in a ghost room, but Pucci claims that all his actions are decided by destiny. 
Emporio slips through a crack and sees a vision of the future. He runs away from the guards, but Pucci blocks his path. Emporio changes course, causing the guard to trip, as predicted by the future. Pucci then begins a lengthy speech about fate and gravity. By accelerating time, he imprinted the knowledge of the future into everyone's minds. And that is happiness. Not just one person, but everyone will be able to face their destiny. Ones who are able to face this are the ones who will be happy. Emporio runs off, stepping on a mop that whacks him in the face. No one can defeat fate, except for Father Pucci. If Enrico allowed him to escape, he'd grow and come to detest him. Emporio was determined to leave this prison and escape at Cape Canaveral, so Pucci sped up time to defeat his past destiny. This is for the good of humanity. Die, Emporio. Inside the crack, Weather Standisk is seen in Emporio's head. Destiny is predetermined and cannot be changed. If that's so, then I could just make you change it for me. Thanks to Jolene and Weather, Emporio was able to change his fate so that he would acquire Weather Report. The stand attacks Pucci, but he simply accelerates time again. Realize your insignificance as you crumble away. Pucci is then sent into the piano by a mysterious force. What? What is this? Weather Report! Emporio explains that the most deadly poison is the air we breathe. Highly concentrated oxygen is poisonous, and Emporio used Weather Report to saturate the room with oxygen. Since Pucci is moving at an accelerated speed, he's more affected by the oxygen than Emporio. The stand grabs the priest's head as he begs for his life. You lost to fate. Walking the path of justice is true fate. You insignificant brat! After finishing off Pucci, the universe resets once more. Emporio is then seen on the side of the road near a gas station. Hermes steps out of a bus, asking him for change so she can pay the fare. Nevertheless, the bus driver drives off, with Hermes yelling in anger. A man with pink hair asks for gas and food money in exchange for a ride. A storm starts as a woman inside says, Get in, little boy. We're not bad people. I'm Irene. His name is Anakis. The two are going to meet Irene's father and ask if they can get married. Hermes agrees to give them 10 bucks, but wants to stop off at Cape Canaveral. Irene tells Emporio to get inside since he looks cold. The boy then notices the star-shaped birthmark on her shoulder. My name is Emporio. As they drive down the road, they stop the car to pick up a hitchhiker that looks a lot like Weather Report. And with that guys, that officially ends JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 6 Stone Ocean.